the show where anything goes. Motivation, mindset, recovery, philosophy, and life. We become who we are through what we experience. We all have a story, and this is My Backstory with Josh Boyer. The My Backstory podcast with Hamidi Jassim here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, you guys can follow, find him on Instagram under uh, at the terrorist whisper. Um, so I want you, I'm super stoked about this podcast because like I said, uh, before the podcast, he asked me if I had read his book. So if any of you guys haven't read his book, um, I recommend that you get it. I will be getting it, but I purposely did not read it before this spot, this episode. And there was a reason for that. And the reason is because I wanted to get to know Hamity, just like you guys are about to get to know him while we're talking because i feel like it makes for a better conversation like i don't have any preconceived ideas or notions about anything it's like cool we're gonna get to know each other right now so i'm gonna allow him to share his story with you um it's fat from what i do know it's extremely fascinating and the way that we connected was uh through west whitlock from rogue american um sent me a message man this would be a great podcast for you and that's a, that's a, just another example of the beauty of podcasting. It was a networking that you get to do. Like people that you've podcasted with, like, hey, man, this person would be good for you too, man. You should, you should hit them up. And that's how it just keeps going, you know? And it's like, man, this is awesome, man. I love it. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you do most of the talking and uh, share your story with us, man. Your backstory, your upbringing, what your life was like, how you got into working for the U.S. government, what that was like, and kind of what you're up to now and what you have going on. So uh, how many did you see? Take it away. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's an honor being here. Yeah, for sure. Honor here being with your audience as well. And uh, yeah, my story is uh, I'm born and raised in Iraq. I was born and raised in Iraq. And uh, as an Iraqi, you know, uh, living under Saddam Hussein was a very uh, difficult life. Uh, yeah. We didn't have a similar life like you guys did here in America. Right. Our life was pretty much oppressed under Saddam, and we lived a very uh, tough life under the sanctions back then when uh, you know, the United States had sanctions in Iraq. And you know, of course, when the sanctions were on Iraq at the time, the sanctions were on the people, not Saddam himself. Yeah. So Saddam got to live and eat healthy food and live a great life, him and his people and the people that supported him and everybody else in the country was pretty much screwed. Yeah. So you lived a rough life, uh, life that was pretty... Um, similar to the you know people who lived here through the Great Depression, uh, you couldn't afford to eat meat. You couldn't afford to eat, to buy the food that you want. Um, you had hard times every single day in your life. You know you couldn't. Uh, people were just barely making it by the day. You know, I remember like uh, you know uh, how you hear every single day about the meat market and how expensive meat gets and people have to find alternatives to get protein other than meat, whether they're just eating eggplants or potatoes or trying to find vegetables that are cheap yeah. enough to get by to feed their children and to get by. And, uh, you know, uh, at the time, you know, everything just didn't look good. And, uh, what were people doing for work? What was the main like industry out there? The I time? mean, there wasn't much going on, to be honest with you. I mean, you're talking about during Saddam Town and the Iraqi soldiers had to pay their own way to go to to go to work. So, so they weren't like being paid to be yeah, part of the military? Yeah, I mean, it, the Iraqi military was mandatory during Saddam Hussein. Wow. Yeah, it was mandatory. It wasn't like an option. And if you if you don't go to work as an Iraqi soldier back in his time, he, he will cut your arm. People, I as a kid, I walked by people who were armed were caught because they didn't want to go to the military. Because no, because they just escaped the military for a couple of days, or they were late on going to work. Wow! And they had a military police in every parking lot or every garage that would check people. Uh, so if you were an Iraqi soldier back then and you don't have the right stamp yeah. that you were going home or you were legally to go home, you could get you could get killed. What was the uh, the commitment that you had to give to the government? Like so as far as three years, three years, three years. You have to do three years as a soldier. Right. Uh, and some people, you know, they were volunteers, so they had to work there and yeah. get paid different money. But three years, regardless, you know, I think that during that Saddam, Tom, if you are someone who graduated college, you'll have to do a year and a half. And if you are someone who was not graduating college, you leave high school and then you go for three years. And of course, you know, Iraq was in wars nonstop from the Iran-Iraq war in 1980. So it was it was devastating. Um, I think looking at an Iraqi soldier during Saddam regime, it was like looking at a homeless man. 
Really? Pretty much. Wow. You know, so your dad was in the military? Then? My, my dad was an officer in the military. And, uh, you know, my dad was an officer in the military. He, he, he worked because he was an officer way before Saddam came into power. Right. So um, he, he, would, he would have a lot better treatment as an officer uh, than what a soldier does. But right. um, truly, like the other soldiers that I would pass by, their situation was like devastating. Some of them, their families had to sell their own goods, their own food, so they can go to the military without getting in trouble. So and, how do you think a guy like that stays in power for so long without people just saying like we've had enough like because, I mean, with the, the amount of suffering because he made in examples for people that's what saddam is known for saddam had made examples of people that did not obey him right. what he did is that saddam when he used to want to execute somebody that went under against the regime his ways of doing it is to execute you in public right in front of your own home wow and to make your family pay for the bullet that they will shoot you with <laughs> that's exactly what he did. Wow. Yep. That's Saddam's. That's what Saddam's uh, rules were. So it's basically know? like a fear-based deal, where it was like people pretty didn't want to didn't want to speak out because it's like yep. if we do, we'll be nice. Yeah. Pretty much thirty-five years, Saddam was planting fears on the Iraqi people. To, perhaps to this day, that generation that lived under Saddam had certain fears in their heart. They still cannot make their decisions hundred percent today. They're still afraid of standing up to anything. So when the Iraq War kicked off. Was it like welcomed by the Iraqi people? Or was of course. It like, I mean, because you, you don't know what you're getting, right? You look yeah. at the, you look at the news media, yeah. and you're like, I don't know if what I'm hearing is accurate. If it's not, because I know from like the outsider's perspective, right? Yeah. So if I was looking and someone's coming into my country, right, and they're you know overtaking our country and this and that, and you know quote unquote liberating our country, like I don't know if that's accurate. If it's not, if they're just doing it for their own self interest, like whatever. And so there there can be a lot of differing opinions on that. Um, but you'd say as a whole, you think the Iraqi people were, were excited about the Americans being there? Absolutely. I mean, the Iraqi people were excited and there's a, there's a proof to that. You wouldn't take Iraq in 21 days if Iraqis weren't really right. welcoming. Yeah. Uh, Saddam has expected to fight for six months. So has the United States. Thought they were going to take a long time before they take Iraq. Nobody expected Saddam will go down in a 21 days. Yep. And Saddam was officially over. What happens though had when the Americans entered Iraq, there was resistance in the south of Iraq. Right. And uh, people didn't get why there was resistance in specifically in the south because the, th the south specifically was oppressed by Saddam Hussein. Yep. But they resisted against Americans. And uh, many people don't understand this goes back historically to 1991 to the first Gulf War when Saddam entered when, when Saddam entered Kuwait. And uh, America entered Iraq all the way down to the Baghdad area and decided to pull out. When America pulled out, Saddam took all the Republican guards that were in Baghdad and viciously committed mass cares against the people in the South for not fighting the U.S. military. Right. So thousands and thousands of people got buried alive for the fact that you are considered a traitor, you started a revolution, and you did not fight the U.S. military. Yep. So people learned that lesson that, America might not go all the way down and things can change any second. So that was the reason in 2003, the people in the South were resisting in Basra. Perhaps Baghdad fell over, it got liberated, right. and Basra was still fighting, yeah. which is in the, in the borders of Iraq, Kuwait, uh, Kuwaiti, Iraqi borders. Yeah. And then once they heard Baghdad was over, that's when they put their guns down and went home. Because these people knew that they rather fight than get Saddam to viciously commit yeah. uh, vicious crimes against them and they're just were stuck they didn't know what to do and and that was the reason that people in the south resisted but everyone else um it was great people received the american military people were happy i was one of these guys when the american military entered iraq i was i was extremely shocked that nobody could have believed that saddam would be going down it was impossible there was right. no way any power in the world can take a guy that we expected to look at his name for 500 years because his sons and grandsons and great grandsons. Well, worse than him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, this guy was, in our opinion, this guy was worse than Hitler. Yeah. This guy had executed his own best friends. This guy's had executed his own son in law. Yeah. This guy had shot every single person he hung out with before he became president. He, he's, he would kill anyone for the power to remain where he was. So we didn't expect there would be any power in the world that will be able to take Saddam out and his family and get them kicked out and be a fugitives. Right. And 
You know, myself, I went through a lot of different experiences as a child. I went to prison when I was 12 years old under Saddam Hussein because I refused to give my money to a corrupt uh, uh, regime member. Right. And uh, this was a common thing. If they asked you to give your money, you give your money. And I decided to have a conversation and argue and end up going to prison. And when I went to prison, we have a saying in Iraq that says, a pen can kill you before a gun does. And what it means is that a Ba'ath Party member, which means Saddam's political party, yep. or Saddam's basically only political party in Iraq, because we only had one party. It's not like you guys had Republicans and Democrats. We only have one political party and one candidate. It's Saddam Hussein. <laughs> and that was it. And they can write a report about anything. Yeah. And that report will be taken like better than the police report. Because the Ba'ath the Ba'athist or Saddam's, you know, uh, Saddam political regime members or whatever they say is basically the truth. So I had this uh, police officer wrote, wrote because he wanted to take my money and I ended up cursing him. So he took me to prison and he wrote a report that I attacked a police patrol. Thought I was somebody who was like an enemy of the state. Right. So once I got taken to that prison, I was treated as an enemy of the state. I was not being treated as a child. So I entered that prison for a few weeks. I was tortured. I was hit. I was pretty much trying to get confessions that I didn't know what they were. Right. And if my family didn't pay the money to get me out of that prison, I would have been dead. So when I came out of that at a 12 year old, my life wasn't really the same anymore. You know, well, that's, yeah, I, that's I when I really realized, you know what, like, this is where we live. This is our reality. And um, you're not going to be able to be a normal person in this country. And to know that, like, your dad was, like, an officer in that same regime is, like... Uh, you see, wow. being in the army, that's a mandatory thing. That's right. a lot of people that being in the military. But yeah. it's just about your connections. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, most of the Iraqi people were... Most of the males in Iraq were in the military. Yeah. Every single male in, in Iraq was part of the military. And if you're not, then, then, then it has to be exemptions, like ex extreme exemptions. So it didn't matter. It's about who you were. Yeah. Um, and you're talking about like, you could be, you could be a janitor, but if you're a member of Saddam Hussein or carry the same last name or same tribe, or even from the same state of Tikrit where Saddam was born, yeah. you have more power than anybody else. It's a trip. And it's, it's like, if you mess with the wrong person and you realize that he is from the city where Saddam was born, they'll bury you. Yeah. These people have magnificent power and authority that you can't mess with them and i have people in my neighborhood that lived that uh happened to be from the same tribe of the of saddam's divinity and i remember a, a 14 15 year old carrying a handgun and his belt because he's a member of that family right. and this guy would come to school with a gun and his belt no one said anything to him no you can't I mean, um, you, who would have that kind of balls to actually go and, and talk to this guy? Not, not, not the prince, not anybody. How do you know, like, when you're walking around as an Iraqi, how would you know who's who? You can like, tell. What? You can tell? You can tell immediately because the way they look. Yeah. You can tell between a broken Iraqi who is, like, living under the oppression of the sanctions and not can't afford to have a, a meal. And you can tell between the guy who get dropped in a military Mercedes and two Republican guards, uh, uh, bodyguard drop you off and walk you to school and you have a handgun in your uh in your belt yeah and you come in and you sit right in the front of the class <laughs> and you got nothing to say and you just watch that guy and you be like wow <laughs> you know and you're like uh this is just another teenager right but what if i have an argument with this teenager yeah can't he'll shoot me and what if he shoots me what's what are we going to do the law is not going to be executed on this guy right so you avoid it and then coming out as like a twelve-year-old from prison, how did that change you as like a, as an individual? Do you I think? think I think it changed my whole entire life right at that point. And I came out of prison. I was a different person. I was in the same. I went from being an A student to being like a, a student that didn't give a shit anymore. Oh. Didn't care. I didn't care about like being in the school or I'm like, what? What's your future? You're gonna get out of here. You're gonna go to the military. You're gonna get beat the hell out of it, and then. That's it. What are they, what what opportunity are they gonna give you? So I didn't care anymore. Uh -huh. I didn't care about taking chemistry. I didn't care about doing physiology and all the stuff that I was doing in in middle school. And then I I was um, I came to the point where I was just like, um, I was done with life. 
I just showed up to school. Yep. I didn't care about what I was doing. I didn't care about listening to the teachers or doing anything. And, you know, life was kind of that way, kind of hectic for me. Uh, we have a saying, it says, walk by the wall, don't look left and right. I, I didn't. I walked by the wall. I didn't look left and right. I didn't talk to people. I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, argue with kids that I shouldn't be arguing with. I just walked my way. And if, if you got hit or if you got uh, bullied or hit by somebody, you just walk away. It's your best option, especially my situation that you already been to prison once. You already been in trouble once. You yeah. got out by, uh, you know, uh, a miracle. Yeah. You you don't do anything. So that was my life until about 2003 when the, I opened my door and I saw an American soldier standing there. Wow. That had to be like a, an amazing feeling, being like what you had gone through and then I being think, like. Yeah, it was a shock. It was, it was like a point where like you you open your door and you see a white guy for the first time in your life. And it was just like, what the hell? Were they friendly? Like, yeah, you absolutely. Met? I mean, I th opened my door and it was an American soldier standing there and um, just talked to the guy. I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Texas. And I, I asked him, I said, what's your name? He said, my name's Brad. And I shut down the door in his face. And I went back to my family and they were like, you know, what if what if this is one of Saddam tricks? What if... What if what if this is not an American? I'm like yeah, they gotta know, be. Everyone in Iraq must have been like so skeptical. And it's it's a very big conspiracy theory country, right. because you lived under 35 years. You're being policed by multiple security agencies. Right. People couldn't trust their own kids or their own brothers or their own wow. mothers because wow. they're afraid of yeah. reports being written to the yeah. Ba'ath Party of Saddam regime or. The special guard, whatever it got, the security agencies that we had in Iraq was like magnificent, yeah. insane. You couldn't name who you get in trouble with. It depends what's going to happen to you. Yeah. And when, you know, I told my family, it's like, this guy cannot be an Iraqi because probably this is the whitest Iraqi I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and, and I came back and I opened the door and I, I just looked at him and I said, I said, Hey, are you guys leaving this time? And he said, what do you mean leaving? I said, are you guys staying or you're leaving? He said, no, 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 we're staying. I said, so Saddam gone? He's like, no, he is, he's down. When he said that, that they're staying, yeah. I mean, that was the moment that I think I had a shock moment. Like, I couldn't believe that Saddam's gone. And I looked left and right in my neighborhood, like all these bath party members that lived in my neighborhood, their homes looked pretty quiet for the first time in history. Yeah. These guys had a quiet home. And they were not outside. And the only people outside were the American military. Yeah. And I'm looking at a Bradley driving by. And I'm looking at him, I'm just like, did this really happen? You want to pinch yourself? Like, is this reality? This How is old are really... you at this point? At that point, I was only 17 years old. Yeah. And I'm looking at it, and I was just like, wow. I was like, this, this is insane. Like, this is just something just, you woke up from a dream. Yeah. Or you woke up from a nightmare. And you just look at it and like, what's next? You know, everybody was excited. Um, people like were wondering how the economy was going to be. That's what people first thought was economically. How are we going to live? Like, yeah, are we sure. going to do better? Like, are we going to eat better? Are we going to, what's going to happen? We're going to get electricity all the time. We're going to do this. Um, you know, people were, people started for the first time in their lives to know their rights. How did people like live up to that point as far as like, getting mortgages, going to work, having a job, paying utilities. Is, mean, it, is it all similar to what it is people here? People had jobs. I mean, people had jobs. People had, you know, whatever jobs they were doing. Some people worked for the military. Some people worked at uh, different places. Some people did their own businesses. Um, you know, it, it depends. You know, there are a lot of wealthy people. There are, there are wealthy people. Who but how do they attain that wealth with somebody like Saddam in power? Though? That's, uh, I guess that's my question. Thing is, is that you have to obey the regime. Uh, because we did actually have in Saddam trial, we did have for a certain year where a lot of good people were doing good in business and Saddam decided to take them all and execute them and kill them. And there were just people who were selling sugar and flour and whatever and deciding to kill them and put like an intelligent operative running these business so that way they can make the income. Yeah. So we have a huge case in Iraq. It's called the Iraqi businessman trial that that Saddam executed. It was like hundreds of them. Just picked them up in the morning from the market and executed them and handed the bodies over by 11. And uh, put them on trial with um, Awadal Bender, who was a Saddam uh, appointed judge. He was the supreme judge for the Ba'ath Party. And he just executed like 
hundreds of people in one hour. So within an hour, these people were just bodies. And business-wise, you know, you had to give back, you know? Like people who worked at the, people who worked at Iraq at the cigarettes industry had to give a huge percentage to Uday Saddam son. So these guys controlled everything. Yeah. They were bullying everybody. They controlled everybody. It's like the mafia. And if you don't obey to that, you, you'll get killed. So a lot of people were really oppressed. Yeah. Didn't have the money. Didn't have the life they were doing. They were like doing jobs to live. I mean, even though my dad was an officer in the military, he still drove a cab at night to make money to put his kids through college. Yeah. And that's that's life. That's how it was back there. So if you're not a member of the regime, you're not getting the extra money every every month. You're not getting the free, free uh, properties and a free land every every year. You're not. You are not. Either you're a member of the regime, or you're a member of not. If you're you're not with the regime, right. and that's how life was. I think for the first time in 2003, that people started realizing that they have rights. People started questioning where would the oil income would go, yeah. and would they have part of the country they lived in and the oil that that country provided or produced. Yeah. So it was a lot of questions in 2003. So how did you get LinkedIn with like becoming like a, an operative, becoming like working for- I, In 2003, company? what I first thing did is I, I joined the Iraqi military. In 2003, the Iraqi military uh, was just getting, the new Iraqi military just getting established. They let go of the old Iraqi military. Uh, they wanted to establish a new Iraqi military. And at the time, people wanted nothing to do with the military because it was mandatory under Saddam. Right. And Al-Qaeda was just started their branch in Iraq because we didn't know what Al-Qaeda was. We watched them. Yeah. We never know what those guys look like. Yeah. The borders were open. We had a very small little uh, sleeping cells of Al-Qaeda operated in Iraq. And all of a sudden, Al-Qaeda entered Iraq and the Ba'athists and Al-Qaeda found a common ground to fight together against the American military. So at the time, people were very nervous about joining the Iraqi military. That was a decision that nobody would want to make. Yeah. There's only a few hopeless people that went to wanted to join the Iraqi military, and I was one of them. I think I was soldier number 19 that joined the Iraqi military. I heard the advertisement on the radio that they, were, they let go of the old Iraqi military and they wanted new people to come join the new Iraqi military. So I showed up. There was an American checkpoint right at the at the recording center. And I, I went to apply, and I was only 17 years old. And I, I applied. And I, I went in, and there was an American guy there. And the American guy looked at my ID, and he said, oh, I'm sorry. He's like, you're only 17. We're taking 18 years old above. So I went back to my neighborhood. There was a guy who fakes IDs. Huh. He faked my ID. I went back the same day. Went back to the same guy. And he looked back again and he just, I was hoping he would not remember me. I changed my clothes. He looked at me and he's like, I thought, I thought you were 17 two hours ago. I said, well, we had a birthday. And he laughed and he was like, you know, he's like, well, how did you do this? That's like, I just faked the ID because I wanted to get in. He said, I'll cut you a deal. Go get one of your parents to sign this application. I'll let you in. I grabbed my mother who didn't speak English. She signed the application. And I went in and I went in as soon as I went in. I think it was like the first time in my life crossing that door, which was the mop station to to get cleared medically and get a ship mandate to go to be trained by Vietnam veterans, American Vietnam veterans. Oh, really? And MPRI, the company that came and trained the first battalion of the Iraqi military in 2003. Interesting. And they had uh, mostly uh, retired Vietnam veterans. Uh, Marines. These are the old hardcore non-Marines. Crusty, salty. Crusty, salty, careless. <laughs> right. And, you know, they put me on the first shipment date to be trained with the first Iraqi battalion. So yeah. it was about 150 of us. We got shipped in the first shipment. We got there to the base. And the second shipment got blown up by a car bomb. Oh, wow. Because they didn't want Iraqis fighting side by side in Americans. And once that thing happened, it, it kind of killed it. It turned off a lot of people from coming to be part of the Iraqi military. So you were stuck with that first group for a while. Yeah. So when we got there, you know, it was the first time in your life as an Iraqi, you know, you you don't know any of this, the, the culture of, a, of boot camp yeah. and the American culture. You don't know any of that. Yeah. And we got there and all the instructors were wearing one uniform. Yep. 
I have, I have in my pictures uh, uh, the uniforms where um, I still remember they were like a, a bluish uniform. Yeah. And those uniforms, like they were wearing hats and uniforms and the military boots. And uh, it was big guys. These guys were big compared to the Iraqis who were little. Right. And all this, I remember as I'm sitting in the bus towards like the end, the little guy, I was like the youngest guy sitting in there. And I was thinking, you know, in my head that we were going to get to training camp and they're going to welcome us and say, hey, you know, welcome to the Iraqi military. <laughs> Thank you for being courageous, for being here. And I still remember, uh, you know, remember now that most 99% of these Iraqis didn't speak English. I, I spoke a little bit of English at the time. How'd you learn English? I was going to ask you I, mean, I mean, I, I, I knew how to speak it. I knew English when Americans entered Iraq, but I didn't know how to speak it pretty well. So I, I was sitting in the bus and all of a sudden one instructor is like about six foot tall, gets in the bus and he goes, get the fuck out of here, <laughs> out of the bus. Right. And he just yelled in a very violent, extreme way. Right. And it was not welcoming. <clears throat> and you're like, shit, what did I get myself into? And, and he really is every, every single racket in that bus one, like, holy crap. Yeah. This guy's mad. He's like, he's, he's angry. And he was super angry. Yeah. And as soon as people were getting out, it was like five, six people yelling at your face as soon as you got out. And all I heard the word push-ups. And I, I heard the push-ups. I looked at the other Iraqis, I explained to them. I'm like, what they want you to do is they want you to do push-ups. And they're like, that's so like, if they stop yelling at me, I'll do push-ups. Yeah. And everybody went down. They were doing push-ups the moment you got out of the bus. And then people didn't know anything about the culture of the American training and the way American boot camp ran. And I was like, well, all of a sudden, I just got out of the bus and I find myself on the hard, hard stones doing push-ups. Yeah. And uh, getting yelled at for like, have a miles people like instructors running after you and yell, yelling at you and we got into the the training and the training was interesting it was about three months they trained the first division of the racket military to this day this is the only division in the racket military they never got demolished in front of vices i uh, never lost the battle nice. they installed a system with that division today that division is considered the qrf of the racket military we have about like 20 divisions today in the Iraq military. Uh, perhaps every division is signed to a certain area in Iraq, except for the first Iraqi division, who is considered a QRF, right. a quick reaction force to any division or anything that happens in Iraq. And they have developed the division eventually right now to be like equivalent of the Iraqi special forces of Iraq or the Iraqi counterterrorism units. Who's in power now? Uh, you mean like who's in power of Iraq? Mm -hmm. Oh, right now is like Prime Minister Adal Abdel Mahdi. Uh, and uh, Barham Saleh is the president. He's a Kurd. So has it changed the dynamic? Has it changed like Iraq for the people? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it changed a lot. So like the the military, um, the first Iraqi division. There is a lot of the things unique about them that when those American um, Vietnam veterans were training the first Iraqi military, they wanted to mix Iraqis together, yeah. and I think they did something that was magnificent that. For the first time, they brought Kurds from the north. So they have three recruiting centers, Baghdad, uh, Basra of the south, and Arbil right. was in the north. So what they did, they mixed each platoon with 10 people from different states. So each Iraqi platoon had Kurds, who mostly don't speak Arabic, mm -hmm. had Sunnis. Arabs, had okay. Sunnis, had Shias, had Yazidis. Right. And you had people from Mosul. Right. It was such a, a like uh, a very, and I think it was like a free comedy central all day because you got people from one country who don't literally understand each other, right. who has never been around each other that much. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, for the first time, you know, you find yourself being, uh, being there with everybody. And it was, it was a great experience. Um, and we just all trained. And as we were training in the base, things were happening in Iraq. American military started getting attacked. The war was just starting. So and crazy. These instructors, though, that were able to take a bunch of guys who for a large part don't even speak English. Yep. Now, the, not only that, but like they don't understand each other. Like each they, other. Yep. And they were able to train you guys into yes. becoming, it's like. It's a, the training was like very hard training. Right. Because what they did is that for the first time, they changed the shape of the Iraqi soldier. 
Yeah. That we came in as nothing but skinny Iraqis that eat carbs all day. Right. And they brought in, and that's the beauty of it to this day. The Iraq will never have that system ever again. And my belief is that in every building, there was a defect. And what they did is because those American instructors were in charge. They contracted with the five-star restaurant in Baghdad. Yeah. And it was a five-star restaurant. To this day, that restaurant is, is a big, it has always been big. And they said, you're the ones going to be supplying these soldiers and feeding them. And by the way, change their Iraqi diet. They're not going to eat a bread and rice anymore. Make them meat. You're talking about an Iraqi soldier who never ever in his life tasted what a chicken kebab looked like. Wow. Or, or able to, to, to afford it. Yeah. And all of a sudden you find yourself eating chicken and meat kebabs every single day and every meal you had Vegetables, meat. meat. Vegetables, you're eating healthy. Yeah. And you had anything you wanted to drink and you had all your meals and you were fed well. Yeah. So we were fed so well. We were doing PT twice a day in between training in the morning and then at night when we finished training, we come back and we do another PT. Yeah. And within about three months, you saw the shape of every Iraqi soldier in that division was changing. Everybody was big, getting muscular. We started to look similar. Yeah. They shift all that change in three um three months it's a trip people were shaped we were running miles and miles and the soldier was able to handle more and that's something that shocked the rest of the iraqis when this division came out yeah. is that we were not just the hillbillies that entered that gate yeah they were used to seeing like yeah. guys that are just all broken exactly you know? they yeah. used to see broken soldier yeah. a soldier that's broken mentally and physically and all of a sudden someone came out of that gate fully muscular in a great shape fully equipped and ready to take the fight to you and that's what there was a shock like what are these doing what are these guys doing and that's where the al-qaeda and all these terrorist organizations realized that they got to do something about this yeah. that they got to leave the american military for a little bit and they have to concentrate because that's not an american that's an iraqi guy that's a guy who would smell you from a mile away who yeah. knows who you are yeah. and they got concerned that this this movement or if this continues and people continue to join the Iraqi military, they're going to be facing nothing but a tough military and it's going to make their life hell. So they, sh they shifted all their energy about killing soldiers, people who wants to join. Yeah. And the Iraqi recruiting center was getting blown up daily wow. in a daily basis. Car bombs will blow up. And my luck is I get out and I get assigned to go protect, uh, you know, to the Iraqi recruiting center. So we went to the Ambar province. We did uh, a deployment in the Ambar province. The, the uh, Fallujah campaign started in 2004. We came back and they're like, your brigades, are, your guys are going to protect the Iraqi recording center. Wow. And when we went there, we established our Al-Muthanna airfield base back then. We established our checkpoints. Perimeter. Yeah. And our perimeter. We looked at our everything. Haifa Street was about a mile away. Haifa Street was two, the most dangerous two miles in the world back then. Yeah. And they're just about a mile away from you. They can walk to you. And you sat there and every single morning between 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock, that is the time that you are expected to be attacked by either a car bomb and a vicious car bomb where they actually have to chain and lock the driver into the stern wheel so they don't pull out. Yeah. At, or you get a suicide belt blowing up at you by someone just running into the line. So my soldiers who worked right in the front pretty much knew they were dead. Wow. They knew that this is it. If, if you get assigned every hour, you get switched positions to be in the front, to be ID and searching people out there who's coming through the line to join the racket military. You knew if this is that hour, if that's your day, that's your day. Wow. And within that hour, you knew that the possibility of a suicide belt walking into you is about 99.9%. Damn. And you know that every single day they're coming for you. They're going to want to kill more people. And I think one of my worst days is, is they blew up a massive car bomb. And it happened to be in the front of a really busy road. And I think people in that car, uh, people in the cars behind them just died at their own place. Literally from the explosion, from the power of the explosion, people were like dead in their own cars. Right. And uh, the hardest thing, it was like once the media, 
started reporting on that once the you know people body parts were all over the ground yeah. and you had that smell of a human burn the Iraqi recording center turned into a dead spot nobody wants to be part of the Iraqi military anymore yeah. and they weren't done yet you know they knew this this was effective of some sort but it didn't prevent some people from coming Right. People come from different places. They wanted people didn't have jobs. People didn't have an opportunity in their life. They heard these people start hearing the military and that they're getting paid pretty well. They eat pretty well. They're being treated pretty well. They're equipped pretty well. And there's a lot of people like similar stories to mine. Yeah. So when I got out of training, I was sent to be trained by Marine Corps instructors uh, and joined a team called the PSD team. It was about twenty NCOs that got picked up, and we got trained by. Uh, a Marines uh, bodyguards. And we got trained and we we're specialized in, in, in uh, protecting higher security personnel, yeah. uh, protecting buildings. And uh, I end up, you know, going back there with them to Amuth and Airfield Pace. And uh, we started operating with the team and the team stayed together. And our job was, you know, we worked at our, our duties and at night they'll bring us all together. We'll, they'll send us and we'll do raids uh, at night at certain people houses. We were more of like the elite soldiers or the NCOs that knows what they were doing. And we just went in and got arrested people. So I ended up detaining one of Saddam's duck card guys. One of the guys that were in the duck card. His name is Shamsuddin al-Mashadani. He was the vice president of the bath party. Oh, wow. And um, I landed in his house at uh, 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> he was in his second wife house in Baghdad. And uh, when the Iraqi intelligence had provided us the information, uh, they didn't tell us who it was. They're expecting to see until we actually got on the trucks about halfway and they called in the radio and they said, okay, well, we're expected to see Shamsuddin Mashadani. And uh, to me, that was like uh, a big deal to yeah. every single soldier in that convoy. This was a big deal. Yeah. You know, last, just a few months back, you were nothing but an oppressed Iraqi kid that got beating in these guys are prison. And today you're about to do a raid on the on the Ba'ath Party vice president. What's the order? I can't take him alive. <clears throat> no, we, we needed to get him alive. <clears throat> needed to take in him every alive. way, we needed to, to bring him alive. And that was like, the, that's the joy of it. And that's the joy of it. Right. Is that you needed to bring him alive. Yep. And we conducted that raid and um, it, it was in a villa in the middle of Baghdad that we went in and... Uh, they said, you guys had no long than about a minute and a half. If you do this in a minute and a half, you pick him up, put him on the truck and get out. You'll make it out. If you don't, all his guys are going to wake up in that neighborhood and you'll find like 400 people around you and you never get out of there. Yeah. And when we went in and we're like literally rehearsed what we're going to do. He was a big guy. Yeah. And people went through the main villa door and uh, me and another soldier took the side uh side door that goes straight to the kitchen and uh before i approached the door the door opened and here he was he opened that door because yeah. he heard the noise yeah so people were already in, inside of his house coming from the back and i just came face to face with him and i put my gun on him and i started yelling him asking him to turn around he put his hands up he was terrified you know he, he saw a soldier fully equipped and cover and cavalry and body armor yep. and pointing that big gun on his face and he just landed down and as soon as he landed down i try to handcuff him and then someone pulled me from my um uh, from my body armor handler in the back yeah. and it was his wife Oh, shit. She pulled me. She was yelling and she, she pulled my the handler that supposed when I get injured, someone will pull me from it. She pulled that and the body armor came across my neck. I was getting choked, but at the same moment I had my gun in his head yeah. and my hands were literally on the trigger. Oh, I could shit. have killed him. Yeah. So my other soldier jumped in and he just punched her and took her down. And I immediately took him out and the other soldiers came around. So we decided to carry him. We didn't even handcuff him. So we literally lifted him off the ground we ran out, we threw him in the in the truck, and we drove out. Yep. And through the way, as we were driving, we were handcuffed him in the car. Oh, wow. Because we wanted to get out of there. That's smart. And as soon as we literally drove about maybe not even half a mile away from the house, that's when shooting started. Yep. They woke up. It was too early. They were all one in bed. By the time they went and grabbed their guns, we were already out. We drove out. We brought him to the base, and uh, this was like a, a, a enjoyable moment. That's like the first time you got that confident in your life. Like yesterday, 
I was a prisoner right. under this regime. Today, today I am someone that actually going to. I I'm detaining the the vice president of the Ba'ath Party. Yeah, and and there's something like in your head that we're playing tonight. And I think we were quiet when we dropped him off. We put they put him in prison. The Iraqi intelligence took him over, and uh, we were looking at each other. We we're like, we just we just detained this guy. <laughs> and I, I looked at my other teams, and I'm like, I heard a lot of movements in the back, and they're like, yeah, we we're bunching him through the hallway, yeah. and they were bunching the hell out of him because when I arrested him and I carried him and I put him in the car, he was fully closed. You know, he was fully dressed. Right. When I took him out, his clothes were like ripped off and he was like in a bad, <laughs> you know, he was like a dress to go out in the morning. Right. And this guy, when I took him out, he was like nothing what I just picked up. And I'm like, what did you guys do to him in the back? They're like, we we're bunching the hell out of him in the back. Because yeah. every single person in that- Had experienced some kind of- Had experience, some kind of experience with that regime that people hated them. Yeah. So we handed him over. And uh, after that, I was, a, I, was, I was a platoon sergeant doing my job, a regular soldier in the Iraqi military. And one day my, my commander comes in, he goes, I need, I need to talk to you, come to my office, uh, take your platoon, I'm gonna send you guys, and, and we're gonna send you guys, I need you and your lieutenant to go do a mission, and uh, you guys need to go to Haifa Street and pick up dead bodies of Iraqi soldiers um, that barely just attempted to fill an application. These are not even soldiers in the military yet. They just filled the application, they went through MOP, they got their medically checked and they're waiting for a shipment date. They left the Iraqi Reconic Center, and the Iraqi public transportation drivers had a deal with the terrorists on Iver Street. And instead of taking the opposite direction to take them to the parking lots where they get their public transportation moves, yeah. to drive through Haifa Street and then take them out of the car and shoot them. So these guys were civilians. They were barely just filled by application. It was about 25 of them they took out of the car. Wow. Shot them, left their bodies in the end of Haifa Street under a bridge right on the side of the Tigers River. So when we got briefed, you know, my lieutenant looked at me and he's like, you know, he's like, why would they put the bodies like right on the river uh, for some reason? Like why, why the bodies would be like right on the river? And we just were questioning ourselves that um, we didn't know what we were, what, what, what really the point of the bodies were being in there. So we were pretty nervous. So the, 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 the Iraqi military got together. We went down. And, uh, you know, we had a platoon. It was about, you know, 29 of us total. And uh, we drove. And as we drove through Haifa Street, and Haifa Street was pretty quiet that day. It was a quiet as you drove in. It was just like... Eerie. Eerie. Yeah. Something is not right. Yeah. He drove a pin and hear it, and he's like, something is not... Something terrible is about to go down. And I went through. We drove and towards the end of Haifa Street. And you can see people from far away, like people from the small little neighborhoods in that area. And the area was known to be very pro-Saddam. Right. That used to be Syrian refugees that <clears throat> lived in that area who were actually loyal to the regime. Yeah. And there were people who used to work for the special guards in Saddam's regime who lived in that same area. So we went through, we went, got to the dead bodies. We parked our cars because we have to walk a sandy hallway going all the way down to the columns of the bridge and they were like laid the bodies there and the bodies were still bleeding wow. we got there literally looked at the bodies and just trying to decide how we were gonna bring our trucks to put those dead bodies in the trucks to take them to the Iraqi morgue or the Iraqi hospital so their families can go pick them up and that's our job yeah. as we were talking literally about what we were gonna do the first rpg flew into our first truck before even moving. Yep. At that moment, we realized we were pinned down and they intentionally put the dead bodies there because once we walk under there, we would never be able to get out. Yep. The river is right behind us and they were hiding right behind the walls that's facing the river. And that neighborhood was impossible for you to see anybody and they had higher ground than you are. Yep. They had a sniper in a building that was in high ground as well. And the only cover that you can take was the columns under the bridge. So we got stuck there and we thought this was a more of a quick fight, quick firefight, and we realized it wasn't. They were there right at your face, pushing you down. And uh, we got separated, me and my platoon sergeant. 
uh, from uh, my platoon uh, uh, leader. He was a lieutenant. He left uh, to go behind uh, a column. I stayed behind a different column. Uh, we decided to take higher ground. So there's a stairs that goes from the bottom of the bridge to the top of the bridge. So we wanted to take a high ground. Yeah. And that's when we found out there was a sniper right there. And it was ready for anybody that was going to make high ground. And uh, first three Iraqi soldiers that tried to attempt to go through that stairs to go up to the bridge died right on, there, on, the, on the stairs. Yeah. When those three died, we realized that this was a, a professionally crafted ambush. Yep. This was not regular guys. And the ambush was actually crafted by a former um, Republican guard officer who was known as a big terrorist back then named Sayed Hitchum. And this guy had created this ambush. And we sat there and we didn't know what the whole point was. And the point was is to capture an Iraqi soldier in uniform because they have killed every single person that's attempted to join the Iraqi military. But they wanted to make a better statement by capturing an Iraqi soldier in uniform. And who sent you guys on this mission? Was that? It's our Iraqi military. So the Iraqi military sent us to pick up the dead bodies. Right. And they wanted to capture an Iraqi soldier in uniform yeah. so they can scare the people enough from joining the Iraqi military. So they were playing the psychological game to scare people from being the, part of the Iraqi military. And that day, they wanted to make sure they run us out of our ammo. And what they did is that we originally depends on a QRF, Quick Reaction Force. When you get engaged, you call your Quick Reaction Force, your Quick Reaction Force make it to you, and that's how you get out. So within the first few minutes of that firefight, we called immediately after the first casualty, we called for a QRF. Right after we went through Hyper Street, they planned IDs because they knew exactly where our QRF, Quick Reaction Force, would come from. Yeah. So as we were hearing on the radio, waiting for our Quick Reaction Force, we hear on the radio our Quick Reaction Force were being blown up and getting engaged and had their own battles before they even made it to us. Yeah. So they couldn't even make it. Once we got that call on the radio that there, our soldiers are not able to make it to us, we knew that this wasn't going to end anytime soon. Right. And we had to observe our ammo. We had to make sure that we were careful what we were doing. I sat there, long story short, after an hour and 45 minute in firefight, I left there. I had the shrapnel above my eye. My eye was cut, I didn't know. I had a shrapnel behind my knee from a grenade. And I, most, one of my buddies uh, was shot by a sniper that went through his kidneys. I tried to treat him and he died right in there. And I went to count my soldiers. An American medic came in and she's like, you're, you're bleeding a lot. And I said, oh, it's not my blood, someone else's blood. She's like, no, 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 it is your eye. If you put, put your hands above your eye, above your goggles, you're gonna see your, your eyebrows are open. And I put my hands in there as soon as I felt that, I, I lay down on the ground. And I, I felt like my leg wasn't moving anymore. And I, had a, I was a bleeding because I looked at my pants and my pants were like all, my military pants were all like red. Soaked. Soaked in blood. And I knew, like, I was like, what, where did that blood come from? And uh, I thought it was like a sweat, and it wasn't. It was blood. It was right. just going through my legs. And I, I uh, lagged down on the ground, and I asked for one of my um, squad leaders. I was like, you need to count everybody. Like, where's everyone? Like, we lost about. He, he was like, do, do, you, do you know exactly how many we lost? I was like, I don't know, but I, I see three over there. I see another two here. So just count everybody. In my head, like, we lost maybe about seven, eight people. And... Um, I just realized we actually lost 20 people that day. Oh, wow. And uh, it was nine of us. There were left? When he came out, he's like, it's nine. I said, what do you mean it's nine? I said, the, you know, the, the lieutenant went into a different section and uh, probably the lieutenant and his guys are fine. Just check on them, see if he lost anybody. And he's like, no, there's nobody there. And I'm looking and I'm looking for the lieutenant. We're yelling, we're trying to figure out where the lieutenant is. And as the American medic took me in, she got me up and finally came out of that hill that I was pinned on right. up to the American military half came out uh, through the other side of Baghdad, the first cavalry unit. And once they see the Americans, they run away. So as the American medic was taking me out and I'm finally coming out of that hell, there was an intersection right in Haifa Street. And as soon as I looked at the intersection, I see a body that was like literally wrapped up to the traffic light. Yeah, to the tenant. And the body looked familiar, but there was no head in the body. That person was beheaded. Yeah. And I looked around and that was the body of my lieutenant. And I realized that he ran out of ammo. And what I was told that he, he surrendered and uh, he was beheaded. 
Wow. And uh, I heard them screaming through the fire fry, you know, saying, God is great, Allah Akbar. And I thought they were doing that for the fact they were attacking us. Yeah. And I didn't realize some of them were actually doing that while beheading him. And when I came out, I got into the ambulance and I'm just looking by and I went back. I went to Ibn Sina, the, Iraqi, Iraqi, the American uh, Medical Combat Hospital, got treated. I left the same day. They left their shrapnel on my knee. They're like, it's not going to do anything for you. We don't have time to get it out. We're busy. Yeah. Wrap, wrap me up. I like, go back to your unit. I went back to my unit. And uh, as I was entering my unit, half of my unit was quitting their jobs. People who had families, people who came for the fact just getting paid, living a good life, yep. just realized this wasn't going to be a good life anymore. And I was seeing people actually who dropped the uniform took their civilian clothes, backed up their bags and left. The There's no repercussions for that, right? So if they just want to quit, they can just quit whatever yeah, they, they want. Yeah, they can quit whatever. Yeah, there was nothing. There's no contract. Yeah, they, they need, there was a contract, but they didn't care. There was no There's no law right. or anything you can enforce it. So they just left. They're like, yeah, this is not for me. I appreciate the money, but it's not going to work. So people were leaving and I sat there and I was just like, in a moment, a pretty quiet moment, you're sitting in the barracks room. I just locked my door and I hear people leaving. And I sat there and my commander knocked on my door and um, he asked me if I was okay. And he's like, you guys are going to come with me today. The minister of defense wants to meet you guys. And I said, fine, I'll go there. And it was going to be like what he gives you a little bit of money as a thank you. So this was a tragic, tragic day. And we just all got on our convoy and we went to the ministry of defense. And right there that night, I think I got paid like maybe... $200 equal, you know, it was like, thank you huh. for your sacrifice. Here's 200 bucks. Wow. I, I got the money and I turned it around and I, I gave it to my other soldiers. And I said, you know, the guys who died, their families are going to be here, you know, like give it to their families. Like, I'm not going to do anything with this money. No. I'm going to die anyway. What am I going to do with it? He kept it in my pocket. Was that really your thought that you were yeah. going to Yeah, you pretty much. Die, yeah. At that point, die. like when I, I got to see the war at its highest level, yeah. I was like, if not going to kill me today, they're going to kill me tomorrow. And if that's the power that they have, we're going to get killed. What kept you? What kept you in it? What kept you like from like being the, one of the guys that left? Um, I didn't want to go back home. I didn't want to go back because what would be the difference if they go back home and they kill me in my own neighborhood, or I just get killed in uniform? Right. And that was the decisions that we were making. That were like, I looked at some of the guys who are not leaving, and I said, "You have an option. This is the first time in your life." that you're able to carry a gun, the first time in your life to have a constitution, the first time in your life to turn the table on these guys. Yeah. And today you're gonna let them scare you and put you back to who you really what used to be. Right. And it's a decision that you had to make today. And I just said, I said, you know what? I'd rather get killed here in the uniform. I'd rather shoot them and they shoot me and end that story. Then I go to my neighborhood and I have nobody. I was like, at least I have you in my back. Right. I was like, think about what you guys are doing today. And you know, the ones who left, I think I appreciate the ones who left because these are the weak ones. These are the ones that were not in it to fight. Yeah, they're in it for the money. And they're in it for the money, they're in it for the job and they were not there to fight. Right. The ones that stayed that you knew that there is a reason that they were doing this for. Whether they loved their country, whether they hated the guts of these guys. And they said, you know what? That's what it is. We're not gonna get broken after one firefight, you right. know? Let's go back tomorrow. Let's show them a better day. Let's set them up tomorrow. They set it us today. We'll set them up tomorrow. Yep. Now the war has gotten violent. Let's be more violent than they are. And that's the moment I think it changed everything. And all of a sudden you find yourself around the guys that really wants to be there. Yeah. And that are willing to fight. And even though 50% of the unit left, but the guys who stayed... Uh, mostly from people who lived outside of Baghdad. They couldn't go home. And they just said, you know, I remember saying one of them, he said, uh -huh. you know, Iraqi salary of Iraqi soldier because the war got really bad in, in Ambar province and Ifa Street. The salary of the Iraqi soldier just jumped. Yeah. It was like a million Iraqi dinar at the time, which equaled to like $700. I mean, you're talking about people who never seen $10 in their life. Yeah. And you're saying you're getting paid $700 a month. And I still remember one of Iraqi soldiers made me smile. He said, he said, in my whole entire life, I've never seen 100,000 Iraqi dinar. And I'm about just to really receive a million. 
this mm-hmm. month and he goes i'm ready to shoot the whole world he's like if the prophet muhammad <laughs> rises up tomorrow with these guys i'll still fight him because i want to get paid that million right. <laughs> so he he was like i have never seen this in my life he's like i spent my whole life eating lentil soup yeah and i'm not going to let this go for sure and we went to the iraqi ministry of defense i received a battle promotion battlefield promotion right there and i became a sergeant major at age 19. that's a trip I became sergeant major being at E9 or E8? Yeah, yeah, you I was I was the I became a command sergeant major in the Iraqi military. Oh, wow. This was like someone about 30 to 40 years older than me. <laughs> Cuz the guy left the job. Yeah. The the guy they had left the job. Yeah. He went home. So the minister of defense uh, did the battlefield promotion and I came out and they were like you're you're a command sergeant major in the Iraqi military. Congratulations, go back to doing your job. I went back to my unit and immediately my commander called me back to the office and he said, the American Special Forces had but a special request for you. You're the only NCO in the unit that speaks English. That's and we're going to send you to the Iraqi Ministry of Defense. So I went to the Iraqi Ministry of Defense and I thought like, this is going to be an easy mission. I left my most of my guys in Haifa Street. My PSD team, most of them are, went with me. Yeah. And... It was like we left Haifa Street. It was a good positive thing. We left that battle. We're just going to go back and we're going to go to the MOD. And probably it's an easy job. We're sending our perimeter to protect the Iraqi Ministry of Defense, which is a building that sits right next to the green zone. And they said, this is the American advisors who are going to be building the infrastructure of the Iraqi military. So I went there. I thought it was an easy mission. And I get there and there was a front checkpoint, very similar to what we had in the the Air Force Base to the Iraqi Recording Center. Yep. And when you set up a checkpoint, pretty much you're making an invitation for car bombs. Yeah. So we set up a checkpoint to the front, to the red zone. We set that up. As I went inside of the building, my um, counterparts were Marine Corps guys, you know, Marine Corps NCOs. And they walked in and threw in the building, showed me everything. And as, as we were walking through everything, I'm looking around. I'm like, I'm looking at the Iraqi faces that was in the building. Some of these higher Iraqi generals that just were being brought back to the new Iraqi military. And I'm looking, most of these guys are the same guys that worked for Saddam. Oh, wow. You can tell, like, these guys were not there for good interest. Yeah. So we looked at it, and then we just kind of went back to, to our unit, and we just looked at it, and we're like, guys, look, this is interesting. They want us to fight the enemy in the front checkpoint, while most of our enemy is already behind us. It's already, like, inside of the building. Yeah. So we're like, isn't this a joke? So my guys were joking. They're like, oh, well, the checkpoint is probably going to be more secure right now. They're inside of the building. Because you'll just face a car bombs, your enemy's going to come right at your face. But what are these guys are going to do going inside every single day? And as I went in, I walked into the building, I secured it, um, set up the checkpoint. Car bombs stopped blowing up literally the next day because you had a checkpoint right in the front. And it's set right next to checkpoint one in the American Green Zone. So you started experiencing mortars, Katusha rockets, all this little attacks. And my job was to protect... 40 to 50 American advisor who would cross from the red zone, who had a special little door that would cross from the red zone to the green zone, uh, from the green zone to the re- to that area. It's called yeah. the red zone, the MOD. And their job is to build the infrastructures of the Iraqi military, establish all these little departments, Iraqi operations center, uh, joint operations, logistics, everything, and start that establishment of the Iraqi command ship. 4,000 Iraqi employees will enter that building every single day. I have to search them clear them so they can be in the same common ground with the American advisors who are coming from the green zone. So this was a very common ground. So the American Special Forces uh, officer there in charge had wanted me personally to do that job. And I came over and I was establishing my job and doing my thing and uh, secured everything. And every single day I'll look at Ely's faces, searching them. My soldiers are searching them, getting them in. And within about, I think a few months, the Iraqi government was changing based on the religious background. And once you change that, it was became where a piece of a cake and the Sunni and the Shia and the Kurds have to sublet that cake. Yeah. So what they were doing is they were not looking for a qualified minister of defense to lead the Iraqi ministry of defense. It was like the Shia, you take the ministry of interior, we're going to take the ministry of defense. That's true. That's what I was going to ask you too. Like when you guys were fighting along, you know, you guys are fighting as soldiers uh, in the Iraq um, military. Some of you had to be what Muslims, right? Yep. 
some of you or were the other religions that were there uh, muslims yazidis christians and uh, you guys were you all fighting Kurds. you guys used to fight against each other and now you guys are fighting with each other it, was pretty that- much yeah i mean like w- there was no difference within the first iraqi division you know you all trained together you all fought together right you all considered yourself in one team but the religious differences were happening with the political level yeah not within the army i mean we, we didn't care okay um uh, the iraqi the first iraqi military because this is an american planted soldiers right these guys were learned to be brothers to learn to fight with each other and the political side it was very divided yeah. extremely hating each other the, were you guys telling anybody like were you telling anybody higher up like you guys have problems you know by well, we, uh, we couldn't we couldn't because you know the iraqi american the american government was working with these guys to have a sovereign iraqi government but little did they know though they had the little they knew most of these guys like the shiat were most of them coming from iran they were right. not iraqi shiat Right. There were people who are 100% loyal to Iran, to the Ayatollah of Iran. Right. Came out from out of the country and started taking over. So they were dividing things. And then all of a sudden, we get a Minister of Defense from the Ambar province, which where the Marines were heavily engaged. Yeah. He shows up and his nephew was running the whole show. He showed up with like 200 men in his tribe. The Marines were heavily engaged against these guys in the Ambar province. 99% of these guys were fighting against the Marines. Right. When you look at the casualties of the Marines in that area, it's 1,200 Marines that died in there. And then you look into it, that these guys came from that area, all military age. They all had dark elbows. They told you that they were using the guns a lot. They all have dark spots in their forehead, which means they were praying a lot. And showed up and started walking inside of the Ministry of Defense. And you have 50 Americans between the rank of a major to a Fulbright colonel. Yeah. Walking every single day with a nine millimeter in the legs, almost looked like they're just crossing the work street to go to work. Yeah. And it became such a, a hectic place. And me and my PSD team at the time, the guys who were deploying inside of the building, because I had special operatives that deployed inside of the building in front of each department and, and secured everything. And they just looked at me and they were like, this is not going to be all right. You have, he's like, they were like, you look at the face of these Iraqi guys from the Umbar province as an American passed by them, they're like, this is not going to go okay. You yep. can tell these guys are vicious, military age. They're definitely not fighting in the U.S. interest. Right. And what are they doing here? They're her cousins because the nephew brought all these tribal members and they started getting Iraqi Ministry of Defense badges, which means they can use anywhere in the country. They will never be stopped to be searched. They'll yep. drive through any checkpoint. So we weren't sure really who these guys really were, what their what entity they belonged to, but we just kept close and eye on them. And my job was to protect these Americans of all costs. So I was dealing with an American intelligence officer at the time. It was a Fulbright colonel and a lieutenant colonel and his staff. These were the liaison team, the intelligence team that got planted to work there in the Iraqi Ministry of Defense. And their job was to brief General Betrayus every single morning about the situation on the Iraqi military. Yep. So they came in and my job was to protect these guys because these guys were there 24 hours. They had a little location in the MOD and they their job is to report all operations 24 hours every morning back to the Iraqi American command at the time. And Betrayus was right next door um, on the American side, uh, on the green zone. And his job was actually in charge of making sure everything is getting built the way it needs to. And he was the commander of the 101st before that. And he was assigned after that to come and work with us and uh, do all this stuff. And every day you'll have Petraeus come through the building, three stars, two star generals walking through the building. So we were nervous as hell about what was going to go next with these guys. And they had this leader at the time. And that leader specifically started walking the building slowly looking for something yep. and he put a request because we were facing the t- the tigers river on one side and we had and he he was looking at through he put a request asking for one of the towers to be evacuated and we're like this is a guard tower and we are not going to give you the guard tower to be evacuated so you can turn it into a barracks or something like that because it has right. rooms in the bottom of it and uh we weren't really sure what this guy was going to do we were just looking at him. He's moving, moving, moving every single day, walking around the building, looking at every American that's passing by. And the place. we kept an eye on him like closely. Literally one guy was handing him to another as he was walking the building. And I, I put the word out to my soldiers. I said, if you see anything, 
immediately evacuate the American soldiers that's in the building. Evacuate them back to the green zone. It's not that big of a walk. It's like maybe have a, you know, quarter of a mile. Right. But I'm like, you get them out to go their way immediately if anything happens. And if you see these guys come back at any time, because they enter the building with the minister and they leave with the minister. Right. But if you ever see them in the building at a time that they're not supposed to be there, uh, you let me know. So my radio was on, even though when I go to sleep, my radios roll on all the way and I would hear anything. And around like 1130 at night, I get a call on the radio and they're like, this guy came in with about 150 of them without the minister at night. So once I heard that, we all, literally all of us got ready for a firefight. We're like, they're here without him, and they're entering the building at night knowing there's only Americans in this building at night. Right. And a few Iraqis on duty. So we immediately ran out. We put our covers. We ran outside. And I immediately asked my soldiers to evacuate these Americans, get them out of the building through the opposite side. And that was my mission. But thank God we paid attention to detail because it's a, it's a two-floor building. It's a big building. It used to be an Iraqi parliament building. And... Uh, my soldiers, two of them, went to the second floor. I said, just clear every room. Make sure no one is there completely. So we cleared the Americans. We felt safe that once we're going to get the Americans out, they can't do anything. They're just going to face us inside of the building. Right. And one of my soldiers on the second floor called in the radio, and he was like, there's an American guy sitting right in the second floor. And not just that, all the locks at the back of the building has been broken. What we have figured out is the same day they have a brought a T-wall truck truck that actually specialize in lifting t-walls because yep. the whole building was surrounded by 10-foot t-wall barriers yep. there was no in and out there's two doors one door gets you out to the red zone which was my checkpoint and one door goes to the americans so where the hell they were going to come out from what they were planning to do is they noticed this american guy in the second floor who was new in the country and he was making this mistake by Staying until about 11 at night right. when he was supposed to be out by four o'clock. They broke all the locks and they brought a truck that lift T-wall. So once they actually lift that T-wall, they make a hole. They can drive out. Yep. And they have armored Mercedes. They have Mercedes, armored, brand new Mercedes given to the minister. Once they put that American guy in that Mercedes, we will never be able to stop. Yep. Where that American guy was going to go? Definitely the Umbar province. The Ambar province was a huge campaign, a lot of pressure on them. And this was the only opportunity in their life as members of Al-Qaeda to kidnap an American officer. Right. There is no way you can touch an American. You can't just go to an infantry unit like the 101st and rustle an American and kidnap him. They didn't have that kind of balls. Right. But there was one weakness in one location in Iraq that you could do that. It was that building right. because of the nature of the mission. When we went in, we ran immediately upstairs. They were in the downstairs first level debating when they were going to go up. We ran through the opposite stairs. We got that American officer out. We ran him back out. As they went up, they looked. They thought he was in the bathroom. They went and checked all the bathrooms. But we were getting him out through the other side. We got him out. We bound back to our unit. And we just kept quiet. Didn't say anything. We didn't say anything. <laughs> yeah, smart. I picked up the phone. I called the intelligence officer in charge. I immediately notified him. As soon as I called him, he picked up the phone. He called the U.S. command in Iraq. He spoke to John Petraeus, John Casey at the time. And they came back and they said, travel ban on the Iraqi MOD for three days. No Americans entered the Iraqi MOD for three days. They were not used to work with an enemy within five meters. Right. How are you going to do your job building the new Iraqi infrastructure, building the new Iraqi military infrastructure from the bottom? while your enemy is right there with you yep. this was new the second day there was no americans they only put the intelligent guys who came back fully equipped ready to go to war yeah enter the building i was ordered not to talk to them in public so i don't get seen talk to them in public i got another call in uh, at the time colonel burke called me on the phone and he said um go outside of the mod go towards the green zone um it's going to be a collection, American intelligence collection team that wants to meet with you. And I said, who, who these guys really are? He's like, it's going to be some civilians. You, they want to meet you, get in the car. You're going to see them. They're going to, they're going to pull over, get in the car, and, and you'll find out. 
And I went outside of the building, literally. I, I just went in and nobody saw me and I went throughout the building. And uh, I, I sat there and a couple SUVs pulled over from the gray zone. And uh, they opened the door. I got inside and it was like this weird car and it was all blocked in the middle. Like I couldn't see what's going on. And, and a female got out wearing a body armor, gun and civilian clothes. And she introduced herself. She was like, hey, um, I wanna, I'm here supposed to meet you. Get in the car. Let's go. We're going to take you somewhere. So I sat in the car and, and I felt weird. You know, like I, I don't know what the hell I was going. You know, yeah. I didn't know what was going on. It looked awkward. And they drove to a really secure base in the green zone. Uh, no one could see me. And there, got out, and I went straight into like a little villa, little room. It's like out of a movie, right? It's it, it like it's weird. It's like almost I felt I was going to prison. Like what the hell are these guys are gonna do to me? <laughs> what did I do? And they just opened the door, and truly because they're afraid of other Iraqis would see you. Yeah, yeah, would see your face that you're talking to them or anything like that. So they they brought me in. They sat me in a room, and they opened. They got the chair, and I sat, and it was a table, and there was a female introduced herself from OGA. And another male, uh, he was from the Joint Intelligence Operations in the Ambar province, and a, a third uh, agent that was from the DIA. And I sat there, and, and they introduced themselves, and they said, like, uh, do you want to work for us? And I said, like, how many, I don't know how many side jobs I can do besides being in charge in the most dangerous building in the world. <laughs> I said, my troops are getting blow up on the first checkpoint in the daily basis. Uh, I got the enemy inside of the bill. I said, I don't know really how many side jobs I can do like right now. Like work for you as of what? Like what do I do? They said, we want you to work for us as an intelligence source. And I said, well, if you guys want to do something, if you guys are a people of power, go arrest these guys right now. Go detain them. And they were like, no, we don't want to detain them. And I said, what do you mean you don't want to detain them? I said, you, these guys are trying to kidnap an American officer last night out of the building. Right now, you don't have any Americans or a lot to go back to do their job. You guys need to detain these guys right now. She said, we are from the Ambar promise. That's where we're operating, which I didn't realize that these guys were coming from Ambar. These guys that took right. a flight because the intelligence officer in charge in the building have communicated. Yep. Because where these guys come from is the Ambar promise. They're not from Baghdad. Right. So she explained to me that, like she said, look, we don't care about what they're doing here. We want to know where they come from in our section and where we're operating in the Ambar promise. And that's what we're lacking because the Ambar promise was evacuated from civilians. There was no human sources. It was nothing but a battle toe to toe with the Marine Corps. Yep. There was no intelligence. There was nothing of who these guys are, but other than just seeing them as ghosts at night, moving uh, on UAVs, watching them from top. But right. they don't really know the identities of the people who are behind that. And I, I just looked and I said, well, how, how the hell am I going to? She said, we need you to call back. Pretend like nothing happened. And we just need you to go back and figure out the identities of these guys. Is there a way or something you guys done here in the Iraqi MOD that we'd be able to figure out who these guys are? And I remembered we had to get them their Iraqi MOD badges. So I said, yeah, I can. I went I went straight back to the building. I went to the Iraqi personal department. There was this girl that, I, that, that liked me back then, worked in the Iraqi personal department. And I talked to her and I said, hey, did these guys, you know, did, did these guys like fill up any applications, any addresses? Any? She's like, oh yeah. She's like, I had their fingerprints. I have everything. So I went to the database and I pulled about like 150 names yeah. of these guys. And they provided everything. Fingerprint, first, last name, where they live, where they come from. I pulled all that, get it translated, and I send it back to the US intelligence agent who was waiting for it. She took it and she was more concentrated on the guy who was leading them. Yeah. His name was Sabah Delevi. And she was more interested in that guy. And the guy looked sharp. When you looked at him, he does look like an officer yeah. of some sort. He was like the chief in charge of everything. But the way he walked, the way he dealt, this guy was an operative of some sort. He didn't know who he really, who he really was. But the way he dealt, he, he was military. You could tell. Yeah. And he... um. We got his information and she just said, where was this guy? I said, that's his application. It's fingerprint, blood type, everything you need. Gave it to her and then she said, okay, um, we will be back. So what, the, what we realized is that the US intelligence at the time had an old database from the former Iraqi military. Oh, wow. An old database of not all the Iraqi military because we didn't have a digital database in Iraq, but it was a database that the US intelligence had bought from someone that worked for the regime. Right. Who kept... 
uh, database of all the elite names, like 5,000 names of people who worked in a high end places. Yep. They did their match and he came back as a match as a member of Ophidain, so Dom Suicide Fighters. Oh, wow. He was the rank of a major. And this guy was a leading a big terror cell in the Ambar province. And when they heard the minister was from the Ambar province, that nephew hooked him up and brought him to the Iraqi Ministry of Defense. Wow. So this guy walked away from facing the Marine Corps in a very vicious battle in the Ambar province to being in a building right really next to the green zone with 40 American officers every single day wow. who are unprotected. Wow. And we just kind of, when she came back with that, you know, my right hands went straight to my gun. I'm like, let's go. Like, we don't have anything to say. We're just going to go shoot them. Yeah. They're in the building. She said, no, you're not going to go to shoot anybody today. You're going to wait. And you're going to wait until they go home to the Ombar province. And she said, if you agree to work for us, you're going to have to follow every order we tell you to do. She said, you're not going to react with them as a command sergeant major of the Iraqi military. You're not going to react with them as a person in charge of security. You're working as an intelligence source for us. And what we're asking you to do, you're going to do. She said, we need to know what cars they drive. How often do they go home? When are they going to go home? So we went figure out, we figure out their shifts. They change about every two weeks, every three weeks, they switch over. Yeah. So we concentrated on the entourage that this guy was moving with. And the entourage, we figure out what cars they're driving. Perhaps they had the Iraqi MOD batch. They don't get searched. So their plan was once they can kidnap an American, they'll put him in one of these trucks and they'll drive straight to the Umbar province and they know if you stopped. They will look like an Iraqi military or an Iraqi Ministry of Defense office. Yep. And when Iraqi soldiers sees the Ministers of Defense office batch, they don't search. They don't search you. They're afraid enough to do that. Right. So it's kind of a brilliant plan. Yeah, and and you know when that happened, I was expecting them to repeat their attempt in the next day. Yeah. They weren't successful with it the first night. They were like, "Gonna wait a couple nights and they're gonna receive their attempt. They're gonna do something. They're not gonna wait." So immediately, um, they sent American advisors to be fully equipped, fully armed, and no single travel of any American. If you're an American advisor and you're traveling, you need to travel with like five other advisors. Go into the building, stay alert, do your job, but we can't just leave. Yeah. And let them kind of like let the Iraqi military stop. We can't let them notice that the Americans are not coming in. So they, everything went normal the way it was. They, they were waiting to retrieve their intents and we were waiting for them to go home. So he switched shift. He was about to go home. I ran out. They have a place, a tracking devices in their vehicle. And I made the phone call and I told her that he was leaving the building. He left the building, I think about four days later, I got a call. And these agents were like flying back with their helicopters from the Umbar province to Baghdad, to the bio, to the IZ landing down. And as soon as they landed down, she called me. And uh, she said, hey, come over, we're gonna, we gotta talk to you. So I always meet with them in that secure location in a base inside the green zone. And I would go there and I, I went there and I said, uh, what happened? Like, what's next? Is he going back to the building? Is he coming in? I said, you know what, this time if he comes in, I'm gonna shoot him, I don't care what you do. Right. She said, no, you're not going to, he's, he's gone. I said, what do you mean he's gone? She said, he was detained with 25 of his men. And she said, we found a lot of weapons cash, lots of weapon cash. It's actually in the, my film in the documentary, you'll see it. Yeah. And uh, I said, you found a lot of weapons cash. Like how much? She said, it's a lot of weapons. She said, they have uh, under the ground containers and a lot of stuff. And they had a, a barracks for Al Qaeda yeah. uh, sitting in a place. So she said, well done. You did your job. Go back to the MOD. You have a next mission to do. We need you to go clear the building. And we need you to go put a list of every single operative that's operating in the building. Because at the time, the Iraqi Ministry of Defense was seen as the historical protectors of the Iraqi people. Everybody wants the piece of that cake. Yeah. Every terrorist organization were already inside of the building, whether Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, Iranian proxy government, uh, at the time, the Iranian loyalists. Everybody took a department and they just kind of controlled it. For the money side of it, because this was the biggest budget in the Iraq, in the country. Right. And everybody wants to steal it. So they're like, we want you to go and 
not so much looking at these operatives who are collecting intelligence on the Americans, not much, so much looking at the operatives who are stealing money and stealing contracts. Uh, there was so much corruption going on with the contracting department, a lot of bad people, bad individuals there. They said, we want you to concentrate on the one that would threat our American soldiers and the ground. And of course, Al-Qaeda and Islamic State are number one and two on the list. These operatives are there to kill Americans, nothing else. They don't have any other missions or any other agenda. So when I went back, I put a list of all the operatives that operated in the building. I went back and I put a list of all the individuals that I really doubt that works for the outside. And the reason why we had some people made the top of the list, because good Iraqi officers will leave at five and will go home. And good Iraqi officers will get assassinated outside of the wire where they're like, three four miles yeah and some of them lived in dangerous areas in baghdad extremely dangerous but they go home back and forth every single day but they're not dead yeah, no problem so what did that tell you that told you something about them that they were um they were exempt from being killed for some reason right. they're definitely double agents they were not there for our interests they were not there for the rack interests they were there for their organization interests and they come in and they had a guy who made our number one on the list that we were extremely afraid of. And he was an Iraqi colonel who came in every single day, worked at the Iraqi Joint Operations. And he worked in a place that was extremely sensitive, which is the Iraqi Operations Center. And right there, we had um, about 15 American advisors worked in that building. General Dempsey, three-star general, General Treyas, General Casey, General Gorilli. Name any of General, General John Abazed, General Sanchez. All these guys have been to that building. Right. All these guys have been to that room. Anybody visits, any minister or foreign minister comes from any country, Australia, UK, comes to have to go see that building. Have to see that place inside of the MOD, which is the Iraqi Operations Center. Right. And uh, we figure out that this guy was working in that building and specifically in that room. So he was from also originally from the Umbar province lived in Baghdad, lived in a very dangerous neighborhood, and he came in and out every single day, no problem. So we need more information about him. We found out one of the biggest Al-Qaeda wanted guys in Baghdad actually lived in the same neighborhood. It was like his neighbor. And we were like, there was no way in the world that this guy would go home every single day with this Al-Qaeda leader knew this guy is a former Iraqi officer, what other jobs would he be occupying? And he wouldn't kill him. Yeah. There's no, no two ways about it. So we went and digged a little bit more information about looking how close they were. And they said, oh, they grew up together. And this guy was in every single day. He would come from like nine to five. That's his job. he will come every single day. My soldiers will search him. They'll look at his cigarettes. They'll look at everything he has. You know, they'll check everything. He came in and that's it. That's all he does. He goes in there to work. And I bought my, some of my sources, my team members, to watch him. And we said... Uh, the American intelligence at the time said, you know what? Everywhere this guy goes, you guys are going to stay on top of him. Uh, get to know every movement of his, what he does. What computer does he do? Who does he communicate with? Who does he hang out with? So we got this information from one of our guards who are like right there protecting that room, the operation, we call it the Jack. And I got this uh, guy who was like, um, he disappears every 45 minutes for 15 minutes for a smoke break. As the command sergeant major in the MOD, Iraqis smokes everywhere. Yeah. I made a rule where they can't smoke inside of the building. They have to go to a balcony. We had cameras on it. And if you want to smoke, you go to that balcony. And I used the excuse of the Americans being in the building. And I said, well, Americans don't smoke in the building. So you're going to be disrespecting them. For, so for that, go to the balcony. It smokes there. They go to the, there. They ha we have a camera. So when I got the information, they said every 45 minutes, he takes smoke break to go smoke. So I went back to the camera, I looked, and there was no signs of him. He's not, he's not in the balcony. Right. So I went back and I said, where is he smoking? They said, he just takes smokes break. He takes cigarettes and he goes. That's it. So I went back in. I said, I need you guys to find out where exactly does he go in that 40. Follow him in that 15 minute. What is he doing? He's, eight, he's there for eight hours. I want to know exactly what he's doing in that 15, 15 minutes an hour. Came back. He told me that he goes to his locker room. So we thought maybe he goes to smoke in his locker room and he's just been a shithead and he doesn't want to, you know, go yeah. out and smoke outside. So I went back to the U.S. intelligence and I notified them. I said, you know, look, this guy is smoking and, and, uh, and they're like, are you positive he's smoking? Does he smell like smoke when he comes out? And I, I was, I was kind of like, that's a good question. What is he doing in that room? 
went back and they said, find out what, is he, what, what he has going on in there. I said he has his locker room because he comes from 9 to 5. He changes his uniform. He puts his uniform. He put that uniform and then he goes to work. And then he changed to sewing and clothes and he leaves and he puts his stuff in that locker. They're like, you're checking that locker today. As soon as he leaves, you're checking that locker. I said, fine. And that year, that month, who do we have visit in the MOD back then? Mike Pence. Yeah. Back then. Yeah. We had Congress members comes over. We had representatives. It's a, it's a insane the people that walk through that room. Yeah. And we were just at the point of like, okay, well, I'm going to check that locker. So for me, it was like, I have to go and figure out a lock because we all use very similar locks in Iraq. So literally made by the same manufacturers in Iraq. Right. So sometimes the key jams that they don't open. So what I did is I actually took a similar lock. So when he comes to put his key, he may think his lock's not working anymore. And I took lock. I got the size of the lock. I got it, brought it in there. He left like around 5 o'clock, 5.10. He was out of the building. After that, I was in the locker room. Took a lock cutter. And my job was, you know, to clear the locker. Do a routine search, clear the locker. So I went in there and I saw the uniform. And you'll see that in my film as well. And I just, you know, searched the uniform and checked his pockets. It was empty, pens, and nothing in there. I just moved the uniform. It's a little bit dark. And I was not supposed to be seen in there because there's Iraqi officers on duty who I don't know where their loyalty is. Right. And there was Americans, you know, and I said, you know, the Americans at the time were keeping everybody busy, talking to everybody. And I went in and I just opened the locker. I locked it, everything. And I opened it. And as soon as I checked the uniform, you know, I was hurrying up, checking everything. And, you know, I was, you know, the intelligent agent always asked, like, you know, pay attention to detail, pay attention to detail, make sure you truly clear everything. And I knew that she would ask me every little question. Yeah. So I moved the uniform. I was just about to close the, the locker. I moved the uniform and there was this little back, double back that sits in there. So I was like, I knew if I close this locker, she's going to ask me if there's anything else. And I would have told her it's the back. She would ask me if I check the back. So I'm just going to have to check the back now. Right. So I took the bag and I really just jerked the back out. I didn't know what the hell was in it. I jerked it out and I put it in the ground and I opened the back. And as soon as I opened the back and I see a suicide belt full of C4. Oh, wow. With a detonator in it. Oh, shit. And in the middle of the back, it was bunch of tobacco, smashed cigarettes. It was the brand like Rothman cigarettes. Yeah. And it smashed like bunch of top pile of tobacco with cigarettes. And I'm looking at it suicide belt detonator and i'm like i just jerked this back literally i just took it out so fast this right. could have been could have detonated on my face right and i picked up the phone and i called and i was like it's a suicide belt right here and i have americans right behind the wall so i hit the emergency button i was asked to do evacuate everybody evacuated her for one and immediately the iraqi officers and nurse start making phone calls i knew at that point uh, i was done myself as an intelligence source i knew that i agreed to work for the u.s intelligent something anything involved with u.s intelligent in front of the iraqi eyes you're a traitor and they're gonna want to kill you yeah. so when that happened they just like you may want to leave the building now and i'm like i'm not leaving the building this is this is my job that's what i'm here to do yeah. and i'm not gonna go sit in some u.s base and do nothing I'm, I'm gonna be right here i'm not going anywhere i have my team i don't go home i don't leave the building and if they want to kill me i'm in uniform i mean what what are they gonna want to do yeah. And I sat there and they're like, it's up to you, but we can help you if you want to get out. And I said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stay with my team members. And I came back and my teams, you know, were kind of like, they're like, you knew they're not going to leave you alone. This is not going to go like that. And I came back. This guy never came back to the building. He was immediately notified. They made a phone calls. And now all of a sudden, every terrorist organization in that building had knew who you really are, right. identified you, knew you, knew exactly what missions you do. They knew that you did look suspicious in a way. You knew you disappeared a lot out of the building. And now you know who you really are. And I sat there and my PSD team members at the time who were the blueberries guys were all around me. And I, I stayed protected for a while. And we were like the way, the looks I was getting Every single day when I'm in that checkpoint searching people, I knew I was like, something is going to go down. I, I don't know what they're going to do, but if I left that wire outside of the building, I would have gotten shot immediately. 
Did you, uh, were you nervous for like your family? I, that's the, that's the crazy part is that when I was recruited by the Institute Intelligence in 2005, I was told not to make any phone calls to my family because they have access to the phone records. Right. It's not like Verizon. We have Arakana where they have access to the records and they can see, they knew what cell phone number I'm using. Right. And if I call in, I never made any phone calls with my family. I never went home. Wow. And you'll see that in the documentary that's coming out. It's the first military intelligence operation to be released to the public. And I, I don't go home. I'm sitting right there in uniform for like four years. I'm in that building. But do you think if they like these terrorists are like looking like, oh, like who is this guy? Who is Th that's, that's the question is with what they were remaining. Right. So it's like, it's, so th don't you think they would know like who your family was? No, they couldn't because they didn't know my last name. And that's the thing. We go by tribal names in Iraq. Right. So they didn't know my last name. They didn't know who I was. And they wanted to figure out who I was because if I don't leave the building, they're going to have to get to my family. And they wanted to compromise me of some way. Right. And that was the mystery that was remaining is they knew this guy works for the US intelligence. This guy's a spying on us right now, but we don't know who he is and he doesn't leave the building. So what are we going to do to stop him? And it came to the point where they all had to get along with each other in a certain way that they wanted to get rid of me because you have one enemy in common. It's this guy. And I sat down in my building. I didn't do anything. I collected right in front of them, on them, which you will see that in the film. And that have never happened before where they knew who you are and you're collecting on them, but they can't kill you. Right. These are organizations like Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, Anakshabendis, uh, battle core, all these terrorist organizations, some of them you might know, some of them you might don't, right. that that don't operate in front of someone that messed with them and let him go alive. They die immediately. Right. And it became a challenge for them that this is rare. This guy's in a uniform. He's in a, in a higher rank. He has a lot of people around him. We don't know where he sleeps. We don't know where he is. He just pops every morning. And we don't know. And the only way we have to do this is probably inside of the building. So I'm stuck in there doing my job. Yeah. The American intelligent looking at me like saying, you're crazy. You're definitely nuts for staying in front of their face. And the Rockies are saying like, you know, they're going to do something. It's not going to go like that. So I kind of kept myself low profile for a while. I, I actually had to sleep in a building that was airstruck behind the building. This is probably where I got my tumor from. Yeah. And I sat there and I had to change everything. I couldn't eat or drink anything in that building from anybody. Right. For fear of being poisoned. Yep. I had to go eat in a in a US DFAC. The US intelligence at the time provided me all kind of badges, you know, like that time they gave me the international IZ badge and the anywhere, any base in the US any base in the US base in Iraq, I could go and just enter in and eat in the DFAC. So I would go eat my meals in the DFAC, in the US DFAC, in the, in the green zone. And if I don't make it on time, I, I don't have anything to eat. I can't eat in the building, I can't drink water. If I leave my water in my office, I can't come back and drink it. If I leave the food, I can't, I didn't have a fridge. I didn't eat out of anything. Right. Uh, any invitations, I was not allowed to do that. Anyone, it's a normal thing there, they invite you for lunch or something, and I am I, not allowed to do that. I was like pretty much blocked myself from any medication if I need. I'll have to go to the US military hospital and get that medication orally right in there. Wow. So like I couldn't leave anything because this enemy was so skilled in assassinating people. And that's where their craft came from. It's killing people, getting rid of people. So what I did is I I um sat in there and one of my teammates came one day and said, uh, he said, I, I, I need to go home and see my kids. He's like, it's been months and I haven't seen my kids and I, I really can't, I'm stuck here. And what I did, did at the time is that the U.S. intelligence have helped me get all uh, green zone badges for my teammates. So when they leave to go home, they don't leave through that checkpoint. They actually leave through the green zone. And the green zone has about like five different checkpoints so they can just really go and kind of get lost to Baghdad. I have no idea how much intention these guys were paying attention to every move I was making. So I told my uh, teammate to go home. I said, well, you know, use a different gate. Uh, go to the green zone. Um, there's a lot of Iraqis have green zone badges. Right. Um, I didn't know who was really working for them, how many people on the ground working for them. So I said, go go to the green zone um, and get out of any checkpoints. Go home. See your kids. Spend a couple hours, come home. Come after that. Come back to the base. It's not a good time. So he's like, I don't know. He's like, no, I'll, I'll make sure no one is watching me and I'll, I'll be all right. So he left. 
the Racket MOD, after he left the checkpoint, literally 14 minutes after he left the checkpoint, he was assassinated. Oh. He got shot in the head with two bullets. And um, sitting there, uh, we heard on the radio that there was a shooting and, you know, happened. Someone, someone body was in the ground. And uh, after 14 minutes, and, and it was in my head that this would be my teammate. And I was in my office, and I got my call, and uh, my teammates, one of my teammates, came in, and he's just like, "We, you need, you need to get your equipment, and we have to go on a convoy." And and I went there, and I, I went there, and I found him laying in the ground. He was shot with two bullets in his head. He, ha he has not made it to go see his kids. And at that point, I realized this was a message from them, letting me know that you're next, yeah. and that we're gonna get anything around you. And we'll get to you. And I knew that message had been made clear from the faces that was coming in the next day in the morning. Like the message was clear that they were not going to let this go. So I sat there, and uh, at the time, the intelligence, US intelligence team said, uh, you know, it's time for you to exit. Um, don't tell anybody. If you're stayed, you're going to cost your teammates their lives, literally. They all have families. They have to go in there. Like the intention right now is you. And getting away is you're getting all that intention away. Is there a, how did that, how did that affect you on a personal level? You know, I like, think it was, was hard because I was ordered to be taking my uniform out. And that was the hardest part for me. But like Instead, losing, losing your friends though, you know, like when it's like, did you feel like, was there any kind of, of like course, survivor's I mean, guilt where it's like. Absolutely. And you see that in the film as well. I mean, I, I felt guilty about it every single day in my life. Every single day in my life, I felt guilty about it. And the worst part of it is that I was asked to leave. Yeah. The worst part about it is I was taking that uniform and walking away from that battle. Right. And you were losing either way, whether you're in that uniform, whether you're, you're, you're still in that uniform, you're going to lose anyway. And the losses are going to get uglier. And I knew that a year prior that I was needed to leave. And I collected great intelligence on these guys. I collect collecting in front of their face. I literally identified every single person in the Iraqi government that had an agenda against the U.S. interest. Um, provided all more information than I was supposed to. Yeah. Caused them so much damage. And that's the joy that I had, is I was causing this enemy a damage that they don't expect. And I, the hardest part for me was to take off that superhero suit take off that uniform walk away from your job your career your thing everything that you wanted to do right for the sake of other people's lives so it was a very difficult decision i actually walked out of that building and i um was told not to pack anything leave everything the same burn my pictures in the my room get rid of the few things and i locked my office like i was leaving to go to the defect pretty much right got my guns and I walked out and I told my soldiers, I was going to see you guys in five minutes. I'll be back. And I never saw them again. I walked out. I went to a U.S. base to work at a U.S. base for a couple months until my uh, paperwork worked, you know, to leave the country. And uh, I walked out of that building and the, they woke up the next day and they, they didn't know where I was. I went and operated with a different Iraqi unit for a while. And then... Uh, um, I left the country officially in 2008. And came where? Came to the United States here in America. I arrived here in uh, JFK, New York, and uh, within a week I was in DC. I went and visited a, a friend, a uh, gravesite, Megan McClog, who was the highest ranking Marine female that got killed in combat. And uh, went to see, she got killed in Ramadi in 2006. She was one of the Mer first American women that I met in 2004. Who had a conversation with and talked to and had a, a good de facto meal with her every single day and right. um unfortunately she got killed as a major in the Ambar province uh, in 2006 uh, a week from christmas so when i got here i met some of my old friends and uh, a lot of the other i stayed with a, another uh, person in dc and uh, i just kind of stayed there got my paperwork and uh, i moved on in my life i just that's it did you know like at a certain point like what point when you were working at the uh, MOD building, did you know, like, 
I'm not going to stay in Iraq. I'm leaving. I'm going to America. No, not at all. I think this was not in my uh, this was not in my book that I was going to leave Iraq. I mean, to me, I was like 2005. If I live to 2006, I'm lucky, man. Yeah. 2006. If I live to 2007, that's great. Did you bring your family with you? No. Nope. No, nope, I didn't have anybody. I didn't see anyone. I was by myself. So I oh. came to this country by myself, and I just kind of showed up. I found myself out of the MOD, out of the actions, out of all this craziness. Right. And I found myself in Washington, D.C. How was that, man? Were you like depressed? Were you like- To be oh. honest, I think some of it was peaceful times. Some of it was the first time in my life to go have eggs and at, at IHOP at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> right. I was like, what? You can fucking do that? I'm like, that's, <laughs> that's fucking big deal. I'm like, you can have eggs at three o'clock. This was like, for me, like a, a scientific discovery. I'm like, wow, you can go to IHOP at three o'clock in the morning and have eggs and eat a meal. And people out there serving you, not, not sleeping. I was just like amazed yeah. with that. And I would just show up at IHOP at 2 o'clock in the morning for the, for the just, joy of it. Just to do it, yeah. Just to do it. And I'm like, yeah, I want some food at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's and awesome. it was such a cool moment. But I think I got, I got depressed for about six months because this was quiet for me. Yeah. I went from all those crazy losing, actions, losing all friends, this craziness. Yeah. And all of a sudden, and I, my friends, my teammates, my guns, everything. Yeah. And I would lock my doors every single day and everything. And I was just like, where? I'm in a different place. I'm in a different environment. It's almost like you took a fish out of the ocean. Yep. And you put that fish in a fish tank. Yep. And I was done. Yep. And I was isolated, like pretty quiet. I was like, what the hell am I going to do? Like, where am I going to go? Like, what, what's, what's next for me? How are you living at this point? Like, do you have um, money or do you? I did. I mean, I, thank God I collected some money when I was working on the racket military. I had like 13 grand in my pocket. Right. And 13 grand doesn't do you much, you know, eventually. No, they, you here. pay rents and stuff like that. And I was staying with the friends at the time, but I, I kind of moved on. I found a room. Yeah. And at the time I, I even like, uh, went to rent a room in Arlington, Virginia. And, uh, the guy just looked at my stuff and he just, looked at me and he, he was just like, he was like, where are you from? I said, I'm from Iraq. And uh, I lived with four other roommates and they didn't know where the hell I was from. They didn't care. They didn't know. I just lived with me and they, right. they like, they were with me in the house. Hey guys, what's up? And my name is Hamity and just whatever. And, and, uh, and they lived with me and they thought like I was from here. Right. They had no idea. I was just out of the world. <laughs> No, and I, I was just like 100% Iraqi, was working for the US intelligence, and I was spying on Al Qaeda. I think if these three, uh, four white roommates knew that, they, they would probably <laughs> would never have stayed home. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. They would have never probably brought their girlfriends home or anything. But <laughs> I think some of them I stayed friends with over the years and end up seeing all my life story on Facebook. Right. And they're like, what the fuck? Like, did you have any uh, fear or apprehension about going public with like any of the stuff that you did? Uh, for years, I stayed under the radar. I mean, for for years you're talking about i moved on i didn't care about putting a book or anything i just right. moved on in life i met friends and started hanging out with some people in, in virginia meeting people and people were like they knew he's an iraqi was working for the u.s military government or whatever and right. just came to live here and it was hard explaining to people like even women you date or people you had yeah. to explain to them like what what was your job in iraq what, what do you say yeah i was an iraqi soldier in iraq but, but why did they bring you here right it kind of like hurt to explain like what really you were and uh i just gotta remain the same for about a year i chilled out i was doing things i started going to lifetime to the gym i started lifting started doing things i started slowly after six months figuring out how to really find my way assimilate yeah that, i started yeah. figuring out a job and i was working doing some security job something like that and around 2010 i, I met my wife and uh, i think we got married like three months later Oh wow! Yeah, and and uh, I was I was pretty much like uh, started to learn things from my wife as we were like moving, like we were looking at, at everything, and uh, it was like the first time I ever drove more than an hour outside of Virginia. That's what I met my wife. We, we went to Connecticut, and then we got married. We moved to Connecticut, and uh, I was I was just like in two thousand and twelve when the troops pulled out of Iraq and the rise of ISIS. And I slowly was home, moved on in my life, and I was getting all these messages on Facebook, like my teammates were dying one after another. 
yeah. in the rise against ISIS. And I was watching the Iraqi army getting demolished, like defeated yeah. by ISIS. And I, I'm looking at through all that, and it was just, I had a very hard time watching that. I Perhaps I think my wife back then asked me, she's like, do you want to go back? Is that what you want to do? Do you want to go back and fight? And I'm like, I, I kind of do. And my daughter was just being born yeah. at that time. And I was just in a very odd situation in my life. And I'm like, what do I do? My guys are dying. My teammates are dying. And I'm losing one after another. Perhaps if you look behind you in the picture up there, there is about 17 of them that graduated um, in 2004 back with me. And today there was only about five survivors, including me in this picture. Wow. And I just sat there and I, I was like, being eating from inside i didn't know what to do like part of me i was looking at like my teammates are dying uh two of my teammates died in the umbar province two died in mosul and the two others one died in a raid the other one died in an id it was just like daily yeah i was getting these bad messages on my phone and i didn't know what to do and at that point i was just like i gotta do something i gotta figure out a way and i i didn't care about my life at that point uh because i felt like you know I care about what's going to happen to me. And I just said, you know, uh, I might just, you know, my wife said, hey, why don't you write a book? And I said, you know what? I'm going to put my book. I'm going to put my story out, but I'm going to bring their stories as well because of what these guys had to go through, what they endured yeah. to fight for this country or to fight for the Americans that protected them. And, you know, many people don't know that my life got saved about three times by an American soldier in battle in 2004. Um one attack in 2004 in Mathena Airfield Base, uh, an army army sergeant, Sergeant Galvis, I believe his name, Galvis or something like that, with the with the first um, cavalry unit uh, laid on top of me after an attack at the checkpoint. Um, he was a former Marine that joined the army later on and uh, laid on top of me in uh, 2004. Three months prior, when I was in training in the PSD school, um, I had three bullets almost went through my face. And uh, Gunner Sergeant Morales, I think is uh, either, either Gonzalez uh, Morales or Rodriguez Morales. Uh, Gunner Instructor, he was one of my instructors. Um, we, had, we were in the range of training in Taji and Camp Taji and uh, they were trying to shoot Katushas because it was the end of the base, on the base. Yeah. And they had a guy with PKC literally came on the hill that we were shooting at. Oh, wow. And uh, opened fire and uh, the, the Marine Corps instructor took me down to the side. And uh, if he didn't pull me down, honestly, that guy would have shot me in the face. I wouldn't have known a thing. And uh, my, my life got saved a few times by an American. And... Uh, they didn't have to do that. I was I was someone they didn't know. Um, and that was the least that I could have done. And I when I booked my book in 2015 and got released, I think people were shocked. That, you know, people were really shocked. Like, you, you really wanted to do this? Like, are you sure? Uh, and what I did is I actually went and I got every intelligent officer, every intelligent agent, including General Petraeus, to write in my book. Yeah. And what's so interesting is that I had this intelligent agent I was dealing with who worked for a three-letter agency right. who was managing me in my last year in Iraq. And he, uh, a lot of the things that I provided, I didn't know where they went. I didn't know who was after them. Right. All I knew I was dealing with him. I didn't know who it was. You know, like I didn't care yeah. where the information went, where they made a difference. I didn't care. I was just providing valuable information and that's all I knew. Right. And it was nice to write the book because once I put that out, they were able to release back to what I didn't know. Yeah, And, you know, when I sat home and I caught this message and I look and they were like, this information went straight to the presidential debriefing every Wednesday at the White House. And I was looking at that. I'm like, really? So you saw the impact of what you're doing. I did. For yeah. the first time in 2015, after all these years, yeah. I'm out there as a dad, not giving shit in life. And yeah. I'm getting these messages and then I'm getting all this and I'm looking at it. And I'm like, wow. It's incredible, man. I was like... You know, looking at it in a way, and it was just like, I was like, you know, uh, this is something I didn't know yeah. until today. Probably made you feel like a, a sense of like pride, you know? In it you it did in yeah. a way, you know, you felt that way. And uh, I felt like, you know what, shit. Like, damn. It's pretty cool, man. Uh, and, it, you know, the joy of it was not a sense of pride in a way, but it was like, you know what? Hey, I was damaging this enemy. Yeah. Nobody can. You were doing something bigger. Yeah. 
what do you know anybody that was damaging this organization? Do you know anybody that irritated this organization? No. Right. Yep. The answer is this organization is ghosts. And they don't get discovered. But they had a 19-year-old punk was discovering them every single day. Yeah. Getting through them one after another. Yep. Building bios and CVs of all of them. And that's what I felt the pride about. That's awesome. Man. And I'm like, I wasn't that spy intelligence source. As some said, that's the most lethal. As some of them said, that's the most lethal spy in the surge against us. Because we can't kill them. Yep. And that was not the way I was looking at it. I was looking at it. I was like, I was that 12 year old kid prisoner that you guys be in prison. Yeah, for sure. That's what I am. Getting your payback. Yep. And I, I felt that truly that's what it is. That's my motivation. A lot of people wonder like, why would you do such a job for the US government? Why would you go like be right in front of the enemy and do such, such a crazy thing? And I'm like, you have no idea. Yeah. Go read the book. Go understand what's the motives for doing something like that. For sure. Uh, this wasn't being done for money or getting, I wasn't getting paid doing this job. Yeah. I never got paid. Um, a couple of times they gave me like $500 towards paying some intelligence sources that I was getting information from. Right. And I wasn't getting paid doing this job. I was doing them a favor. Yeah. I didn't have a contract working for the US government. I didn't, I was volunteering to help. And you don't have any fears about people trying to come after you even now? I do, of course. You know, my identity still remains uncovered. You know, I don't use my real name. My name in the book is not my real name as well. It's, a, it's an alias name. But, right. um, you know, there is possibilities things can happen. They do have sleeping cells in the country. But however, I do believe this, these sleeping cells in this country have a different mission than the sleeping cells I was dealing with back home. Right. Yeah. These sleeping cells. So do you cells, have things in place, though, to kind of protect you and your yeah, family? Absolutely. I do. I Good. mean, if they if they come here, we'll give them the proper welcome. But if if <laughs> if and definitely won't be like what I offered you this morning. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be eggs and no, no, it won't and be olives eggs. and no, cheese. No, no, <laughs> no, maybe an M two forty nine. I love it, man. So it it, it will be like you know. I, I was just kind of like I, was, I I didn't I knew that some of the sleeping cells on this country and I probably. Some of them will be listening to this segment. Yeah. That I know their mission is to collect in this country. Right. And I know they're not here to kill. And if they do, that will expose them badly. So I know they won't kill me. Right. I can probably walk to some of these places or mosques that have a sleeping cells and just say, hey guys, this is Hamidi Jassim. I kicked your ass 15 years ago. Just out of here. <laughs> and I probably won't do anything. They'll probably just yeah. give me that nasty, same nasty look. But I knew that their mission is different. Yeah. I I understand them, and that's that's the reason is, is I understand their psychology. I understand what they're doing, yeah. and a lot of people were like, "Aren't you afraid they would just kill you?" And I'm like, "That they're bigger than that, yeah. you know. They have bigger goals than just me. Yeah, in my bigger, life, bigger fish to fry. The bigger fish to fry, and yeah. uh, you know the cells that I faced back home, and um, you know, some of them died. Some of them, it's a new, it's a new generation. But I'm also proud of the new Iraqi generation today. That. This is not the same generation that I I grew up with who was afraid, you know. ISIS took over 3% of Iraq. But the young Iraqi generation was able to rise and kick him out. It's awesome. And that's what I fought for. Um, is I fought for to have a kid. While I was fighting in 2005, there was a kid growing up healthy, yeah. not being afraid, not being terrorized. Yeah. And that kid grew up and liberated Mosul and that's kicked insane. ISIS fearless makes it all worth it and it, it kills me like today i'll tell you like i cry when i get messages from young iraqi soldiers and says i am serving right now in the same unit you led 15 years ago awesome. and i heard about you my ncos who are like your young soldiers back then talks about you and i just wanted to talk to you and i'll let you know that i'm serving right now and i see some of your pictures in the armed room i see some of this stuff and it's just it's a, it's like it makes you feel, I'm like, I'm not that guy anymore, man. I'm just a dad that <laughs> do his thing. And I'm looking at him like, you know, these guys are looking it up to you. They're looking at to you yeah. as an iconic guy. You know, you you made a difference many years ago. And because of what you did, I'm here and I'm doing my job. And I, and I was less, that was the biggest pay for me. For sure. And I'm looking at these guys they are like fearless. They're not afraid. And they're like, we just kicked ISIS back. Look at these pictures. We just killed 25 of them. That's awesome. And I'm like, hell yeah. That's what I fought for. for sure. I fought I fought, and I suffered. My teammates died. So these guys grew up to be a better people, better than we are, yeah. better than we ever been. Yeah. So that's what I was a proud of, that most of them liberated Mosul. 
fought a good fight, kicked ISIS ass on the ground, and took back their land. And that would not have never happened with a generation that worked under Saddam. Yeah. And these are 19, 20 year olds that looked up to you, that today looks up to you and says, you know what? We have respect because you fought in Haifa Street with your most powerful weapon was a PKC, which is equal equal to a, a, a two, M249. You didn't have RPGs, you didn't have rocket power, you didn't have tanks, you didn't have yeah. armored vehicles. We have respect you fought your fight with very limited capabilities. Today we are so much more capable. Yeah. So we don't have any excuse to lose. I like it, man. And and that's what I'm a proud of today is I see these soldiers talk to me and say, you know, say things like that to me from back home. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, wow, how much the Iraqis, how, much, how far the Iraqi soldiers came around, you know, how far the mentality had changed. Yeah. And the history that you digged for them on the, on the walls. Yeah. And the path that you put for them to follow. And you know, I may have I may have soldiers that gave up back then, but today I had guys who is not willing to give up even if it takes them their lives. And they gave crazy amount of casualties. They kicked ISIS out. They whipped ISIS off the face of earth. Yeah. No mercy. And made it made reality. And and all of us sitting home. I was sitting home here in North Carolina and and and, and I was getting messages of dead ISIS fighters. It's awesome. And we're like must be a great feeling. Here it is. We just yeah. killed that many for you today. And I'm just looking at it like, I'm like, I accomplished my mission at that point. I felt I really accomplished. I was like, if there's any, anything I have done in that country, if I wanted to make any difference, it's these guys. Yeah. Uh, it's these guys who are saying, you know, I just want to talk to you. I want to introduce myself. I'm, I'm 23 and I was a kid when you were doing this. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, that's really what I, what I'm proud of out of everything I have done. And, uh, if you had one person yeah. who inspired you the most um, through your whole life, who would that person be? What would that? What would that? Either a person or a book, or both. Who would that person be? What would that book be, and why? Uh, people who inspired me. I mean, there's a lot of them. Who do? Um, the reason I ask, I mean, I ask everyone that comes on the podcast that same question, but for you in specific, it's like. It's not normal. I mean, it's not the the norm for like a nineteen year old kid, yeah, to, or seventeen year old kid to join the Iraqi, you know, police force military, and have all yeah. the, and ha, or the military. I'm sorry, and have yeah. all the, uh, you know, you have all these things, all these odds stacked against you. You have all these car bombs going off, and yeah. they're deliberately trying to kill you guys, and you stayed. You didn't yeah, leave. I would say, truly. Uh, one of my uh, guys that I, uh, one of my team members that I admire, it's not a book. Um, he was tortured in Saddam, Saddam prison for years. Uh, his wife was executed and uh, he fought and died in 2004, actually. And uh, that, that I will say, if it comes to the Iraqis that I served with, every single one of them I admire, man. Every single one of them had a terrible story. Right. Did I think I went through a, lot, a, lot, a hard time in my childhood? Nothing compared to some of them. Right. Some of them had like bones replaced in their body from being tortured. Some of them were like destroyed, lost their families, lost everything. And that the, they found that determination. The, the, they were determined to come back and fight. Right. They were determined to face that enemy. They didn't give it up. Yeah. And they fought to the last uh, minute of their of their life, and they fought with with a piece of grass in their mouth, and and they just they just fought against it. They were yeah. never giving up. And I think, as a seventeen year old to a nineteen year old, I admired these guys highly. Yeah. It was my team members, but the way they fought, it it was nothing like another. The way they faced death, it was such an honorable way. And they were, did not pull out. They did not give up. Every odd was against him. And the way they fought, they fought with violence. As much as the enemy was violent, as much as the enemy was mentally trying to break you, these guys found the motivation to stand right back up. Yeah. And uh, perhaps uh, one of my teammates today, who I admire highly, is the Iraqi Command Sergeant Major for the Iraqi Special Forces for the Iraqi Counterterrorism, which is it's huge. Yeah. Uh, they're one of the best elite fighters in Iraq trained by our Navy SEALs and Special Forces operatives. And these guys are like, and he leads his troops today and he just 
talks and he just talks to me every other day and he's like i tell every graduate in class about you when you came in as a 17 year old how, how you were the youngest among us and when you look at that picture you'll see i was the smallest youngest guy in that and some of them already been through the iran iraq war some of them already been like had had been more an adult than i was right. and uh and you know, just just seeing where they are and what they're doing today in their life, and I admired the way they carried themselves on, and I admired that some of them have been in the battle for fifteen, sixteen years, and has not complained once. Are they uh, are they being taken care of? Like you know, like here we have the VA that takes care of our veterans, no, you know, not, after one. Not I mean, as much. Because not as much. I was, gonna, I've noticed like since we've been doing this interview, I'm like watching you, and you're talking about things that for most yeah. people are emotionally moving, you know, it's yeah. like, oh man, like that'll bring you to tears, you know, think about losing your, your teammates and stuff like that. And you yeah. have like a grittiness about you to where it's like, yeah. not that you're unaffected. Cause I mean, it's probably impossible not to be affected by it, but it seems like it's just, maybe it's cause you endured so much at a young age that it kind of makes it easier for you to handle, you know, how do, do you, you reconcile? Some I of think it? because I was born in a war. Truly. Right. I mean, I see a lot of people, you know, like talk about PTSD. You know, sometimes I listen to Dakota Mayor about when he talks about PTSD. I talk to a lot of people who's been seen some actions and try I try to see like what they've been doing or you know, yeah. for me it was not much of the mental side. It was just like the more of the emotional side that I miss these guys. Yeah. They're a part of my life. They taught me everything. Yeah. And um to them it's like nothing. Uh to them I think because they're not out of it, that's why they're not hurt. But I mean, is it? Do you yeah. see a difference though with the guys from America that go through war and yeah. then suffer from PTSD and the guys yeah. from Iraq? Yeah. What's Big the difference. difference, and why do you think that? Because these guys are born or raised in war. This is their everyday lifestyle. Wow. They don't know anything else. They don't know what it is like to be here. They don't yeah. know what it is to have a healthy life. So that's so, probably the difference, then, right? Because the American, the, the Americans, they know what it's like to have peace and be to calm and like whatever. Exactly. And then they go and they yep. see this tragic shit, and it's like that's that's absolutely true. Because right. I look at my teammate today. If you go to fat my uh, Instagram, yeah. you'll see that one of my teammates that I just posted recently, he was killing ISIS leaders. He was a sniper and he was killing a, a lot of these ISIS guys. And there's like a bunch of dead bodies in there. And it's brutal. It's pretty freaking exotic. Right. It's on my Instagram, actually. I'm very surprised. Came in my finger across that Instagram is not taking that off. But, <laughs> um, you know, it, it doesn't affect them because they're not out of it. This is everyday lifestyle. Uh, that's why I posted a vi video and I was just like, what the fuck did you just do? He's like, I shot this ISIS leader and I went back to the barracks. I smoked hookah and we had a good time. <laughs> and I was like, and I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. He's like, yeah, I just shot him in the face. Look at it. You know, and he sent me the picture and I posted it. He's like, I shot him in the face. He's like, dude, that was the best shot I've had in a while. And he's like, my other sniper dude was like giving me shit about not so shooting them well. And I looked at it and I'm like, I realized that these guys don't know peace. They've been in war for 16 years. This is their job. Right. Some of them built family. Some of them got married, made kids, and they were still at war. Yeah. And they go to their job to fight, and then they go home and do their thing. And they, and they, that's their lifestyle. That's what they do. And uh, I, I just looked at it and I was like, wow, you know, like these guys don't know what it is. I, I kind of like, hey, how is your mental health? How are you doing? Like, oh, we're, we're doing fine. You don't look right yourself. And I'm like, yeah. It's right. I was like, you know what? It's because I've been out of it. I got realized what peace is like. Yeah. And these guys don't know. So that's why I think that, you know, a lot of Americans have the PTSD, a lot of veterans going back with different, because it's a different environment. It's almost you're taking like a river fish and you throw it in the ocean. Yeah. And it's it's hard. It's it's to acclimate. It's hard. So you're do, what you're doing is you're bringing guys who grew up in really nice towns, had a grocery stores. They can buy anything. Yeah. they want to go to iraq in a war zone for a year and expecting them to go back and live their normal life that's not gonna happen yeah. who did give me one person that came back and was able to live like normally and uh, and uh, have no memory unless they didn't see any actions because yeah. hey let me tell you the truth is that there are a lot of people who came to iraq did not see any actions yeah who just got lucky yep. people who got deployed during the surge from you know 04 to 08 seen all the action until about july 2008 shit was going out but people who deployed to iraq in 2009 they're like i saw nothing literally i didn't even hear like a firework yeah nothing because it was just a different time different you know while people died in that area thousands of people died in that area so it's just the times are different and it shocked me sometimes also as well i see veterans who came home and they had severe ptsd and I would ask them like, "What did you serve? Like, what year?" And they'd be like, "Oh, I was in Iraq in 2010." Like, nobody died in 2010. 
There was yeah. no action. So why are you having a hard time? And I see some people who are deployed in Iraq and Ambar province in 2006, in the middle of the most violent war in Iraq, came home and did something positive with their life. Yeah. And it shocked me. And I think it all comes back to the person, who that person is, and what they want to do out of their experience. What do they want to make up? You know, a lot of these guys like come home and they do something positive for their experience, whether they write a book, whether they become speakers, whether they go and promote, whether they go and, you know, uh, they do something positive regardless. They go and speak to young soldiers and inspire young soldiers because that's what we need. We yeah. need these guys. So I I'm happy to see that. And, um, and I don't know where I belong in that community too, you know, for me. No, you like, belong in that community like, like just like any other US yeah, veteran, man. And I, no and I, I, I just really kind of see because I, I see like, you know, um, I see like a lot of veterans out there. They're all doing their things. And uh, I'm, I'm, I come from a different culture, you know? Yeah. I, I don't know how to, how to play that author uh, personality kind of guy. Like, you know, I don't care. I don't give a shit about like people. Uh, I, I am a very humble person. Perhaps when I was in my Quitland podcast, you know, all these thousands and thousands of crazy Mark Quitland fans were uh, writing me messages on on my Instagram. Yeah, and I felt the need I had to answer each person. Yeah, I felt like I would be disrespectful if someone asked me a question and I don't answer it. I'm like, I can't do that. And yeah. then in my point is like, like, you can't do that. You know, you're a public figure, and if you, if you don't, and I'm like, I don't because I come from a different culture. Yeah. If a person is asking me questions and they don't know about something, I feel obligated to do so. So it actually took me like a month <laughs> to respond <laughs> to, all the to every single comment, every single uh, message. Hilarious. Yeah, because a lot of times I, like, people just don't even respond in America. You know what I mean? It's like, I know, and I noticed that. There's I too noticed much, and you just don't even get a reply. You know, it's like you know, I we've talked that. about we're all sending messages to people to like. I noticed that for a podcast. And it's I like, noticed that, I and I, I really back. can't sleep my night, man. Yeah. Like if if someone asks me, and you know what, some of these people like were asking me really good questions. Yeah. They will ask me something innocent. They're like, hey, why did Iraq go this way? Yep. And I, I just feel like I can't sleep the night if I don't go answer this guy to say, there's what I'm, happened. I'm the same way. So yeah. I think it's a, it's person to person too, because I don't think it's every American. Yeah. I mean, my following isn't that huge, but like if you look at all of my posts, like yeah. there'll be times where someone will comment <laughs> on my posts and, yeah. and it's not deliberate. I may f not see the comment or whatever. I'll go back months later and reply, you know, because it's like, yeah. I, I mean, can't not reply to people, you know? Like, I, 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 I just felt like, you know, uh, you know, some people like, you know, saying, oh, you know, that's it. You're like, figure you can and I'm like, you know what? Uh, I can't because most of these people are off. The, they're veterans. Right. And they're asking me, you know, like, especially when I hear someone says, I was a Marine. I was in the Ambar province. Thank you for saving my life. I mean, I, I don't answer the guy. Who the hell am I? Right. I just came up. You know, I, I took me a month. Yeah. I just told my wife, I said, look, an hour before I go to sleep every night, yeah. I'm going to take my phone. I'm going to answer people. And I know, of course, I can't write newspapers. You know, some people like want to like interview you, like yeah, literally yeah, want to yeah. ask you every question. And I know they're curious. But when it gets to a certain point, I'm like, dude, go read the book. Yeah, yeah for yeah, sure. The film will be out. You'll enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, you know, go read the book, go read this article, go do whatever. But, totally. but even I, just getting even no. that response is better than no response. Of you course. Know? You know, yeah. no, you know what? It's just, you got to be humble. Yeah. You know, you got to be humble and you just got to, you know, and especially the following that you have are not just any following. Yep. People who follow me, you don't know who they are. Yeah. Like I had Gold Star families reach up to me. I had veterans. These guys, I can't just turn my back on. I put my life in the line to protect them in combat. Now I wouldn't answer them on Instagram. So that's yeah. just like that's commendable, so, man. Yeah. So I I turn around. I I really take my time, but I still get back to them. But you know, at the point, I was like, guys, I gotta you know, I gotta work. I gotta yeah. Gotta concentrate on my family. So I I put a time for it. it. Took me a month, but I responded to everybody. And some of them were like, hey, man, I don't read book, but your book was the first book I ordered. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm happy because that's my point is to educate them, to get them that education that they yeah. need. And, um, and uh, you know, they're great people. They love this country. They love their country. They they appreciate what, I, what I've been through. They yeah. respect it. And I, I don't have that uh, personality to say, yeah, well, I don't have the time or, uh, you know what? It's a, it's a bullshit if someone says that. I actually, I found the time. Yeah. If I can find the time. I worked like 24 hours, man. I barely just go to sleep and work. Yeah. And I, I just, I, I just, I found, I figured it out. I found the time and I answered everybody. And uh, it's nice because all of them right now, like, you know, they, they, they feel like they're, I don't make them feel like, you know, 
awkward. They all feel like they're your friends. No, they feel like they're being heard. Too, yeah, you know, they, they, they've been heard and they've been respected. And you know what? They're, every one of them have a story behind them. Totally. And that's what amazed me is, me is their stories. Yeah. You know, I talked to this woman. She's like, my son was in the Umbra province. He died yeah. there. You know, I'm like, if I don't answer her, do you know like how terrible that is yeah. uh, to do that? I was like, that's just messed up. You know, like be, be respectful, be humble. And that's why I'm like a little bit se separate from this community or anything like that. Because I, I don't want to act this way. I don't want to carry myself this way. And, uh, you know, I talked to some people that like, you know, I, I lost my son. I, I, uh, I fought in the Ambar province. I lost my teammates, you know. If I don't find that time to talk to these guys, then, uh, you know. I get then it, then what, what am I putting this brand out for? Right. Right. What am that. I putting this book for? What am I putting? I put that book to educate the public, yeah, to help them understand what we went through and to share our experience, not just my experience, for them to share their experience with me because they can relate to it. Yeah. And that's the nice part is that that some of these guys have magnificent stories. Uh, they're not authors. They're not famous. They're not people know them, but they fought a good fight and they deserved, you know, to like they deserve to to be heard and talked to and uh, yeah. and. Uh, and that's why, you know, I, I was carrying my own brand. I, I had my own opinions politically on things. And, um, you know, I, I do things. And I, I always, when I went to the media or went to any anywhere, I made sure they don't put wor words in my mouth. I went sure that they don't tell me what to say. Yeah. Uh, I don't do that. I was like, if this is my opinion. If you like to hear it, you're welcome. If you don't. Fuck off. I'll just basically <laughs> fuck off. I'll, I'll go home and I'll enjoy some nice barbecue. Yeah. A lot more valuable time than, than your time. So I didn't care. But truly, I, I've been fortunate. Some some of the media personalities in this country have showed a highly a lot of respect for me and hosted yeah, me. Sure. And, you know, Tommy Lauren from The Blaze, when she was in The Blaze, she was very nice. And yeah, for sure. She had me on and, and, and appreciated me and a lot of others, you know? A lot of stuff, so I, I'm thankful for everything I've been through. I'm thankful for everything, and because without the things I've been through, I probably would not have done the actions after that. I would have, I have not done any of the things, even after I got my tumor and I was diagnosed and everything. And I, I looked at it, you know, uh, was I upset the first day? I was, you know, like I was like, I want to live. I don't want to leave my daughter behind or my kids. And well, for the but, for the listeners that are listening, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you, but like for the listeners that are listening, so he was diagnosed. What year was that? Uh, just this year. The, so this February, year, February, yeah. He was diagnosed with uh, brain cancer, so he's a brain tumor. Yeah, so if yeah. you want to go into that a little bit, and yeah, I mean, I was diagnosed. Obviously, I was exposed to uranium exposure because when I worked in the MOD, the Iraqi Ministry of Defense, it was airstrike during the liberation of Iraq in two thousand three. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they still trying to figure out the cause where this tumor come from, but obviously it's from radiation yeah. because of how complicated it been. Um, I am um, thankful for everything. You know what? If I didn't work in that building, if I didn't operate there, I would not have been able to save a, a life. Yeah. One life. So would I go back and do it all over again? Yes, absolutely. I'll go back. I enjoyed every minute of it. You think but, there's anybody else? Have you talked to anybody else that worked in that building? Or yes. Have any there's issues? 11 Iraqis who just recently were, were diagnosed with leukemia Jesus. working in that building yeah wow worked in one floor actually specifically that would airstrike and it, you know it is what it is that's the war that's what you get out of war no one gets anything no one wins out of war that's what i think personally right. no one wins you know you you come home you're injured they injured that's it that's that's what it is and you know i knew that down the line something was gonna be bad you know i was drinking shit water and uh, yeah. you know i was drinking i lived in iraq that's where i come from so yeah. uh, you know for me um for me it was just i knew this was coming but you have like a, a good like mindset about it you know I mean? I do. it doesn't seem like you're down about I it do. just you like, know what you know, take it I, as it comes i i looked at i truly smiled I, I you have it you'll see it on my instagram i smiled yeah when I came out of that scanning and they like, you got, a, you got a serious big brain tumor. I was about to kill your vision any second and you're not, in, you're not doing good. And I just laughed and I just said like, you know what, dude? I said, I had done everything. Tell right. me something that I haven't done. I done everything. I, I fought among the giants. I fought among the best. I got to know the best people. I got to see people, people will dream of talking to. I got to do things that are exotic. Yeah. You know, I was like, I got supported by people that no one support. They don't support nobody. Yeah. You know, I was like, uh, you know, the director of the CIA, John David Betrayus, uh, supported me. My book supported me. My film. Um, I'm thankful for the support I got. You know, I was like, I'm I'm thankful. I lived a great life, and I was like, you know what? It's in God's hands from now on. You know, there's nothing that I can do. 
there's nothing that I can do to change things or go back. So I was like, it's meant to happen. Um, the positive side is that I worked in that building. I might expose myself to a lot of bad stuff, but huh. look at the lives that I brought home. Look at the For Christmases sure. that I get to see on Facebook, some of these officers and troops and guys that came home and uh, you know now with their families and kids and grandkids. I'm like, you know what? You're, you're able to make a difference. And that's all, that's all, that's all to take. And this was just another challenge for me. So I've been really setting up my mindset for it. I, I just been living my life. I enjoy my time. Yeah. I go work out. I go do things. I, even though I have no metabolism, truly, like I got no metabolism. Right. But I enjoy that. I enjoy that fucking feelings when you're about to die. I enjoy it. Well, when you know, like, yeah, you know, that the end is it could be near. It, it really is, and just I, I. I mean, is that my, what the prognosis is? Are they telling you like, hey, you're you're it, going you know to what? die? It's it, going to kill you. This tumor half changed my life. 150 percent and not in a negative way in a positive way right you know since this tumor i changed my mentality but did they did yeah. they tell you that it's not you can't you, you, know, you can't be cured they they don't know that's the thing is i'm not getting any answers <laughs> that's why i'm going like you know that's right. why they're i'm going to a different higher right. levels of research and everything they don't right. know nobody knows nobody's giving you any answers wow. and uh, you know they were just lucky trying to stop it but i came to the point i said look um what do I want to do today? So I went back. I started actually valuing the most important things in my life yeah. after I got diagnosed is that I started valuing that, you know, life is precious. And if you don't spend it with the, you spend enough time with the people that you love, you're wasting your life. Yeah, yeah. And if you wake up in an angry mood and not happy with your life, remember this is a time that you're disrespecting in your life. You need to value every moment in your life. And I really just started doing things I wanted to do. I started saying things to people that I wanted to say. And I was afraid I didn't want to do it anymore. Yeah. yeah, you know, if someone was ignorant, I would say, you know what, you're ignorant. I don't care who you are. I don't think you're a good person. Yeah. And what you're doing is wrong. And I don't care. And I started going to like working out and they were like, you're crazy, you're going to die if you go do this. And I said, no, I'm going to go do it. I signed up for a CrossFit and I was like doing CrossFit. <laughs> nice. And I was watching every little skinny lady beat me and work out. And it was nice. It was, I enjoyed it. I loved it. And, uh, you know, I was doing CrossFit and I was lifting and doing all this stuff and challenges and I enjoyed all of it. I truly, like, I would, I would be dead after, like, doing that. I remember, like, I, I just, like, worked so hard on CrossFit the other day. I came home, I was throwing up. Oh, yeah. It and happens, I was, man. And I was just, like. You get rabdo, man. I felt, I felt so great. I never felt so good since yeah. I've been diagnosed after that moment, man. That's I awesome. felt felt good. And I was like, yeah, I'm ready. I was like, it's. You just got to push yourself, you know? I didn't do it when I was healthy, but now I am like, let's just push yeah. through and get to the end. But I'm lucky and I'm, 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 I'm fortunate to be here. Yeah, totally. If you, had a, if you had one lesson that you learned your entire life, growing up through the military or wherever, um, that you wish you could share with somebody else to prevent them from going through some heartaches that maybe you experienced as a result of learning this lesson, what would that lesson be and why? That lesson is just, it would be take the positive out of your negative experience. I mean, the war might be a negative experience, right. but take the positive out of it. Take the educational part that you got to see. If you're a Marine or an army guy that fought in Iraq during the surge, take the positive side, the things you got to see and the people you got to meet from different countries and how they were living and the friends that you got to make, which many Americans don't know that. Yeah. Don't have that experience. They never leave their hometowns. Yeah. They never come out of their eggshell. Take that experience and take the positive things that you got. You expose yourself to the outside world. You got to see what's like living in a, in a third world country. Take that experience and turn it into something positive. I don't want to see a veteran that is like, look like a homeless. Yeah. It's not reason to. You have done magnificent things in your life. You have done an extreme honorable service to this country. You got to see things no one see. Usually would pay, people would pay to go see things out of the country, or just different people. Yeah. You got to see this, you got to help, you got to fight. You know, I feel like take that positive energy and make something positive out of it. Live your life, tell your story, do something good in your life and change your life to something that that's gonna be a good way something in a good way that's awesome man if you um if you could be remembered for something 
you know, say like, uh, you know, you knew for certain, like, Hey, I'm, I'm not going to be here much longer. Um, how would you want to be remembered? What kind of legacy do you want to leave? And how do you want to be remembered? Um, for me, I think it's about doing the right thing. Uh, for me, I speak to a community that's pretty hard community, you know, because I am not, um, I am not talking just to my American people. I'm not just talking, I'm talking to people. I am talking that um, my legacy would be different than anyone else. I am talking to young Iraqi Muslims who are, grew up in this country, are joining the military today and deciding to love this country and support it. I am talking a very hard, complicated community and that I am talking to people to change their lifestyle. Telling people that, you know what? You can be barred in this country. You can fight in, the, in this country. You can be part of the U.S. military. Uh, you can be just as patriotic as anybody else from Montana. Right. Or anybody else from Wyoming. Yeah. You know? You can be just as patriotic. You can do the same exact thing they're doing. And it will not be any difference between you and them. Whatever you believe in, whatever you come from, it doesn't matter. And that's what I want to leave is that I see that and I enjoy it because I do have young Muslims reach up to me and says, you know what? I'm going to ranger school. I just served a tour in Afghanistan. I just went to Iraq. I uh, just did this and that. And I feel that because of my story, it gives them that opportunity to say, you know what? There is a person of my background among these military heroes. Yeah. There is. And I, and I see the difference for me. Do you know what I mean? Like, I know when I see Jacko Willing talks to young, a lot of young kids looks up to him. Totally. Looks up to Jacko and they all talk to Jacko. But I know what kind of kids are these guys are. You know, I know that that's a different for thing. You know, yeah. I see when like some people, young kids talk, look up to Dakota Mayor and a lot of these guys. And it's great. But this community that I come from, it's different. Yeah. We have political movements who is trying to poison this community. Yeah. It's a different fight for me. I have like political candidates right now trying to separate that community from its country, from this country, America. These guys, some of them are born and raised here. Some of them came here and grew up here and trying to tell them that America is not good for you. And it, so that's why I think my fight is a much bigger fight. Yeah. Because I'm trying to tell these guys, hey, you can be part of America and you don't have to listen to anyone's political. They just want to separate you yeah. from the rest of your fellow Americans and you don't have to. Divide and conquer. Yeah. And I, I, I fought against it. You know, I stand against it all the time. I stand against all that, whatever that uh, woman, Ilhan Umar and Rashida Talib and all this new products the Democratic Party has created for us. That, you know, it's, it's, that's not the way we represent Muslims in this country. It's not the way that represent a Muslim who doesn't appreciate America, a Muslim who hates America. Because it's the norm. Yeah. So it's what they want you to, to, that's what they want every young Muslim to feel. I mean, and, that's the perception too, I think, from yeah. non-Muslims non and other people. Yeah. It's like, dude, Muslims all hate America, you know? Exactly. And that's, that's that part. Because I can right. show you Muslims right now in uniform serving in Afghanistan, fighting for this country. Right. What are you going to tell them? But that's the sad part is they're trying to cover those people. Yeah. And I'm trying to come up, bring those guys to the light. Because if I continue with my story, if I continue to put my story out there, it's going to motivate others, which it did, to be part of this country and to be a valuable asset. For our military yeah. to be a valuable asset. You have a guy who speaks Farsi and Arabic. You can deploy him to any country, Afghanistan or Iraq yeah. at any point. That's a valuable asset. Yeah, for sure. And that's the thing is just that I'm, I'm giving, I'm, I'm motivating a, a one percenter out of this community, but I'm hoping one day that could be a 10 percenter, 20 percenter, 30 percent or even more. Yeah. And it's, it's a lot of power, a lot of money that's against me, you know? putting that poison in that community, trying to, you know, because when, when you separate these young Muslims from this country, what you're doing is that you're separating them to basically to leave them so someone can come and radicalize them. Yeah. And that's what Ilhan Umar is promoting. That's what Rashida Talib is promoting. You know what? Did Ilhan Umar ever came out of her town in Minnesota? No. Did she ever go to Iraq? What does she know about you, my young Muslim? She knows nothing about you. Right. She doesn't give a damn about you. She wants your vote. Because she's wearing a hijab, it doesn't mean she believes in what you believe. Right. It, don't buy that crap. So that's why when I see young Muslims, you know, tell me, oh, you know, why do you see this? And I'm like, crap. Yep. You know, if you want to, if you, you know, why not have a Muslim in Congress that loves this country? 
Why do we have someone that want to criticize soldiers and hate the military and do all this stuff? Because she knew that people will watch her and will lose interest in loving this country. Yeah, and it makes a lot of other yeah. Americans uh, super skeptical. It, and is. it makes them more skeptical yeah. of Muslims because it's like, it is. oh, they're embedding themselves yeah. into the government now. Yep, she is. trying to make an impact. And it's like, it's, it's she, a bad impression. She's you know? putting people like myself life in danger. Right. She's putting other Muslims life in danger by whatever she's promoting. 100%. You know, and, and what she was promoting has nothing to do with them, with the Muslims. Right. What she was promoting is a product of Nancy Pelosi and Bernie Sanders. She's promoting those guys' agenda. She's not promoting, and that's what Americans need to listen to, is that, look, Ilhan Omar and Rashida Talib is not promoting what the Muslim community wants. They're promoting what Nancy Pelosi and Bernie Sanders. So if you ever want to do it, it's going to come back to some white guy who's doing it. <laughs> you know, it's going to come back to some white guy who disagrees with you. Right. Who, does, who doesn't like you. Yeah. It's another white guy who doesn't like you, who doesn't agree with you. So what he's doing is he's using these minorities against you. But these young Muslims who are growing up here, they don't know they're lost. You know, they have all these big weasels yelling out their face and telling them that, you know, separate from this country. This country doesn't like you, doesn't love you. Pretty yeah. much they're trying to brainwash them. Yeah. So that's why I was like, you know, uh, when that Ilhan Umar came in and all that, I'm like, yeah, it's pretty nice to have a Muslim in Congress. It's a pretty proud moment. But I don't want to have a radicalized Muslim in, in, in Congress. That's not what I want. <laughs> right. That's not what I want. It's like yeah. out of all these good Muslims in this country, all these people in the military, you found yeah. this girl that yeah, to no. really. So that's why I was like, you know, really? Just want you guys know who's behind her. Yeah. You know, the American public don't know. They don't know. Like, no, they don't. They don't know yeah. there's an organization named CARE that's been banned in the Middle East as a terrorist organization. That's the same organization that raised funds for these guys, yeah. for these two congresswomen. They don't know. People don't know that. Yeah. That's why I was like, guys, these guys are supported by a certain power. Uh, they, don't, they don't represent me. If I have a, a billion dollar, I will, I will kick them out of their seat and I'll take their seat away. Right. But I don't. But someone who's paying a billion dollars is putting this woman here. Yeah. And she's going to obey everything they want, all this stuff. So it's all this lobbyist and all this craziness going on. But, you know, I try to educate. That's my that's that's what my mission is. And if I leave a legacy is I want to make that different. Yeah. I yeah. want people to be different. And I, I, I want that fire to, to remain. I don't want that fire to go down. I like it, man. I appreciate, I appreciate you so much, man, being willing to come on the podcast and allow me into my your pleasure. home. And now, your story is absolutely incredible. Thank and you. I think a lot of people are going to listen to this podcast and like, you know, not only Thank resonate you. with a lot of people, but it's going to educate a lot of people. Absolutely. It would be my pleasure. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah, Thank you pleasure. so much, brother. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you what's, for being here. And what's the best way for people to connect with you if they want to connect with you? Uh, just go to my website, theterroristwhisperer.com. That's where you can get your autograph books. Uh, you can, um, yeah, send me an email. You can uh, go to my Instagram, the at the terrorist whisper. And you'll see my uh, film poster uh, as a profile. That's how you know it's me. Yeah. Just uh, Instagram or IG Instagram or social cool. media, the Terrace Whisper. That's what it is. And uh, and my website. That's it. Good stuff, man. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to reading the book now that I've met Too. you and I've, I've heard yeah. your story. Now I'm going to read the book and it's going to be, it's going to all pleasure. make sense to me, man. So absolutely. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's my honor. Thank you for listening to My Backstory. Stay motivated and stay connected off the show. Follow at my underscore backstory underscore to be a part of the journey to recovery and to see where your story goes. Or visit us online at hereismybackstory.com.